Hello everyone and welcome to my review and critique of Horizon Zero Dawn, the new game from developers Guerrilla Games, best known for the efficient if somewhat clunky Killzone series. Before we begin you should note that this is a review and a critique so I will be discussing the story in detail together with game mechanics, graphics, sound, pacing and all that fun stuff. In other words this video will contain spoilers, lots of them in fact, main quests, side quests, all sorts of spoilers. There will be more spoilers in this video than on my Twitter feed after a new episode of Game of Thrones has just aired and those arseholes on the East Coast feel the need to spoil it for everyone else. Horizon has an interesting story and if you're at all sensitive to spoilers I do recommend you play the game first. Horizon is an excellent game although it's not without its flaws, in fact there are a fair few of them, however not all flaws are created equal. Horizon's problems don't stop it being one of the best games on the PlayStation 4. I'd probably place it below The Witcher 3 and Bloodborne on my personal list, but above Uncharted 4. You might have noticed this video is quite long. I've included timestamps for all the different parts of the video and if I figured out how to do it then I'll make sure they're all hyperlinked for ease of navigation. I should also point out that this is my first ever video so if there's some issues with the sound and footage and all that sort of stuff then I apologise. Last thing to note before I get stuck into the critique. I'm not going to cover all of the story in one go because it's bloody long. I've decided to take a similar approach to what Guerrilla Games has done with the story. The first act of the game is story intensive with limited gameplay beyond a few basic tutorials. This is important to set up the scene so I'm going to focus on the story as well for a bit. Then after the first act the game opens up and Aloy is free to do what she wants. At that point I'll focus on reviewing more traditional parts of the game. Then I'll go back to the story and break things up occasionally just to try and stop you getting bored. Ok let's get stuck in. Horizon starts with a cinematic credit sequence as a man named Rost carries a young baby on a journey through the wilderness. It looks lovely and tranquil until Rost points out that machines actually roam the land and should not be messed with. It is one thing to hunt a beast. Another to hunt a machine. You must be humble and respect their power. I will teach you this one day. It's a stunning introduction to the electronic beasts in the game and it bears more than a passing resemblance to that first view of the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. I'm sure that's no accident. Rost is taking the baby to her naming. It's quickly clear that the baby is not welcome at the ritual but one of the matriarchs goes rogue and quickly performs the ceremony anyway. Rost names the baby Aloy in a scene that now borrows heavily from the Lion King. Seriously if it weren't for fear of a copyright strike I probably would have put Circle of Life on in the background here, although I'm also guessing that joke has probably been made like a hundred times by the time this video goes up anyway. Other matriarchs show up and they make no effort to be nice to young Aloy. What have you done? I've blessed the naming of a child. Stubborn woman, you call that curse a child? It's pretty brutal stuff. Rost and Aloy clearly aren't going to have an easy life. As someone who didn't pay too much attention to the trailers and that sort of stuff that came out before the game was released, this was the first time I learned that the other mystery in Horizon, in addition to the machines and where they came from, is actually just going to be the presence of Aloy's mother or who she is. So we've got two things to think about. And wherever you go, I will follow. The next time we see Aloy she's about 6 years old. She tries to be nice by picking some berries but a woman insists she's not to be spoken to because she's an outcast. I know it's a fairly obvious way of having the player sympathise with Aloy but the lack of subtlety didn't detract from the emotional response I had to watching it so I guess that's okay. Aloy runs away and trips over which sends her tumbling into a cave. Fortunately even though Aloy is only 6 years old she's already graduated from the Lara Croft school of tumbling and she did so on a Nathan Drake full tuition scholarship I think. She's able to pick herself up from all these knocks with barely a scratch on her. The cave is part of the ruins from the time of people who are referred to as the old ones and it's largely untouched. It felt a little convenient at first just to have this cave out here in the open that no one has bothered to go down into and explore but we later learn that the Nora tribe in particular are terrified of anything relating to the old ones. 
For the sake of the story, I'm prepared to believe that they would just leave this open cave here unmolested. We take control of Aloy as she explores the cave. It's worth noting her animations here. Despite the fact that this young version of Aloy is only a tiny part of the game in terms of hours played, clearly no expense was spared in making her look and control like a young child. The way she sort of stumbles and nearly falls over, especially when she's going upstairs, reminds me of the first time I played Uncharted 2. There was that sort of wow moment where Nathan Drake would like realistically brush walls with his hand and just sort of interact with the environment in a way we hadn't seen before. It's a shame most of our time with young Aloy is spent doing tedious tutorial stuff because she's actually really fun to control. Aloy finds a dead body in a cave and strolls right on up to it. She grabs a device from his face which we later find out is called a focus. The focus serves the part of witcher vision or detective vision or survival instinct or just whatever you want to call it. I guess we'll go for focus vision in this video. This sort of thing is present in far too many games these days but more on that later. When you're in focus mode, movement is frustratingly slow and so is the camera speed, you can't even really turn at any kind of speed at all. At this point there's not a lot to see. Aloy uses it to find out how to power up doors and she discovers a few secret audio diaries belonging to the people who used to live here. As expected so early in the game, the diaries don't really give much away. We can tell that the previous civilization suffered from something and many of them opted to commit suicide. That's about all we really know. Aloy eventually makes her way out of the cave and is reunited with Rost. Rost teaches Aloy how to heal herself, which means we have to go through the insanely tedious process of just pressing triangle to pick up healing items. Once that crap is out of the way, we learn how to do stealth, and it's about as exciting as picking up healing items at this stage. The stealth mechanics borrow heavily from games like Uncharted 4 and Shadow of Mordor. Basically you just duck down and try to hide in long grass. It's not made entirely clear at this stage why the machines are aggressive. Now that probably sounds stupid, you would just assume that the machines are going to be aggressive, of course they are, it's a video game, we have to fight them, right? Well the machines weren't always this way. The game doesn't do a great job of explaining this, but in recent years there's been an event called the derangement, which has made the machines more and more aggressive towards humans. You do get more details on that later in the story, but it's kind of drip fed out and it's actually not made really clear I don't think. After Aloy successfully kills her first machine, Aloy and Rost run in the direction of a scream and spot a young man called Teb lying on the ground with no way to escape from some machines. This part of the game is incredibly contrived, even by the standards of a tutorial. Rost wants nothing to do with it, but using her focus, Aloy is able to see the patterns the watchers will take as they walk. This allows her to move from patch of grass to patch of grass without being spotted. That sounds cool, except when you look a bit closer you see that the watchers are basically only moving up and down a relatively simple pattern or maybe they're moving in a circle. And they're also going quite slowly. All Aloy really has to do is move when their backs are turned, it doesn't take a focus or really even much more than some common sense to do that. This definitely falls into nitpicking and I probably wouldn't have even mentioned it or care that much except when you escort Teb to safety he keeps making remarks like, oh my god how are you doing this and this is incredible and stuff like that. Again, all she's doing is moving when the watchers aren't looking. I get that it's good for a six year old, but Teb should be more than capable of doing this himself. Anyway, it's only a tiny thing, but it really got a what the fuck reaction from me when I was playing it, so I figured it was worth mentioning. After these heroics, Aloy has a run in with a young boy named Bast who throws a rock at her. You're given your first chance to decide what Aloy does next, and it's immediately clear that none of these decisions are likely to actually impact Aloy's character development or her relationship with others. Uncharted 4 did something similar and to be honest I'm not really sure how I feel about this kind of thing yet. I suppose I come down on the side of liking having the choice, but it doesn't add much to the experience. Since the alternative is probably no choice at all, this is at least a way to keep players engaged during cutscenes I suppose. Aloy's outcast status means that members of the Nora tribe can't even talk to her. She confronts Rost about this and he explains that she was given to him by a matriarch named Tirsa the one who we saw do the naming ceremony. Rost doesn't know who her biological mother is. The only way to find out is to win the proving. Completing the proving gets you status as a brave and admission back into the tribe. 
However, winning it means you get a, what's described as a boon from the matriarchs, which in Aloy's case would be the chance to ask a question. Unfortunately, winning the proving will take years of training, so that leads us into a montage of Ross teaching Aloy to fight until we pick up again when she's an adult. I sympathise with game developers when it comes to tutorials. They're in the complicated position of trying to develop a product that might be played by someone new to the genre or even new to gaming itself. They can't alienate anyone and that's why we get tutorials like this. It does at least fit with the narrative. If we'd started the game with adult Aloy then there would be an even more contrived set of circumstances to teach the player how to do things that Aloy would already know. At least in this case we as the player are inexperienced and so is young Aloy so it makes a bit of sense. And ultimately the tutorial only takes up a small percentage of the game and we do get a decent bit of character development from it. It is a bit weird that we get to practice picking up rocks but techniques like rolling are actually left for the player to figure out by themselves. We sort of told to do it but I didn't see any button prompts for it or anything so it's a bit of inconsistency there. Okay it's nearly time for the proving but Rost has one final lesson to impart. He takes Aloy outside the embrace where she's not usually allowed to go and has her take down a sawtooth that's been terrorising the Nora tribe. The lesson being that to win the proving you need to be prepared for all eventualities. He's not kidding. Before tackling the sawtooth Aloy purchased a tripcaster and that definitely came in handy for the fight. The tripcaster allows you to set a trip wire that does different types of damage to machines that walk into it. At the beginning of the game you're only able to do shock damage. But later on in the game when you've bought a new and improved trip caster you can do fire damage and explosive damage as well. Now obviously nothing in the tutorial had provided any kind of a challenge up until this point but I have to admit I died to the sawtooth the first time I faced it. It looks a little bit embarrassing looking back at the video now because it doesn't seem to be that difficult a fight but you know this is a new type of game and this fight came as a shock after what had come before it. The sawtooth moves quickly and takes a lot of damage. If he hits you you'll lose like half your health bar in one go. It's However, if you prepare properly, you'll learn that his weak spots are susceptible to a different type of damage than his body. After laying a few trip wires and preparing with fire arrows, I was able to take him down pretty comfortably the second time. This teaches you that not only do you need to prepare for a fight, you also need to think a bit during it. Not something I'm used to doing, to be honest. Now Aloy's ready for the proving, but Rost has one final surprise in store for her. He's saying goodbye. When Aloy completes the proving, she'll be a brave and a full member of the Nora tribe. That means she can't be seen with Ross who is still an outcast. It's against the law for them to even talk. Aloy plans to sneak out and go and talk to him anyway and acknowledges that he won't be able to talk to her back. Ross's having none of it. He wants what's best for Aloy and that doesn't include her risking her new status as a brave just to talk to him. You get to choose how you say goodbye but let's be honest it's kind of clear you're going to see him again. In fact I'd go further and to say that Rost basically has a sort of ticking time bomb over his head at the moment, like a countdown to the moment when he makes a noble sacrifice to save her, I mean it's fairly obvious. Aloy enters Mother's heart and for the first time in her life she is free to talk to the Nora. She explores the village the night before the proving and witnesses the tension between the Nora and the Kaja, another local tribe. The Kaja have sent an envoy to Mother's heart to apologise for events that happened under the previous king. They're promising that the new king wants peace. This part of the game serves as a good reminder that you, so far you've only seen a small fraction of the local population. There's clearly a much bigger world out there. Aloy spots a man in the crowd who has a focus like hers. She's initially interested because it's the first time she's seen another one. When she goes up to talk to the man named Olin, he tells her that other tribes are more willing to accept technology from the machine world. Just because the Nora are backwards doesn't mean everyone else has to be. Olin acts shifty during the entire conversation and he doesn't really want to speak to Aloy even though she's really keen to speak to him and to get information. Aloy then gets hit on by a commander called Erend who gives her a bit more information about the Kaja even though he's from another tribe called the Osirum. Aloy briefly meets Teb again, the man she saved when she was six, 
and also Bast, the boy who hit her with a rock. Bast will be Aloy's main competition in The Proving, along with a woman named Vala, who is almost as confident as Bast, but she's much nicer about it. So at this point we've had a lot of build up to The Proving. Rost has trained Aloy for over a decade, he gave her a final challenge against the Sawtooth, he said his goodbyes, Aloy entered Mother's Heart and met her rivals, she had a big moment, the stage is all set for the big event. Unfortunately, the proving falls flat. The group is tasked with collecting a certain machine part from a group of grazers, which is basically shooting fish in a barrel. Aloy gets her machine part, but Bass destroys it and she has to get another one. By the time she does, Aloy is losing, so she takes a shortcut despite being warned of the risk. Of course, we're still early on in the game, so all we really have to do is a few basic jumps and a bit of climbing to get Aloy first across the finish line. This was a huge letdown after all the build-up. I expected a lengthy optical course and a shooting challenge and a lot of stuff going on, even though I kind of knew it would be easy. This really only required me to push forward on the analog stick and occasionally press X. It was really uninvolved. That said, I guess the proving itself isn't actually supposed to be the main event, it's what happens next. The Nora Proctor, who just announced that Aloy won the proving, gets struck down with an arrow as a group of cultists descend on the new braves. We're still in the tutorial section, so instead of all the attackers coming on at once, as would be sensible, they come in waves which gives you a chance to fend them off. The tutorial quickly reveals the limit of combat against human enemies. You aim arrows, and you shoot. Compared to the challenge in taking down the machines, it feels woefully underbaked. The problem isn't so much this particular battle, it's what I know is coming down the road. The humans here will go down relatively easily, especially if you get a headshot or two on them. However, if you've played Uncharted or Tomb Raider recently, you'll know as well as I do what's coming next. We're going to get beefed up humans in absurd amounts of armour who can take ridiculous amounts of punishment for no logical reason, and they'll wield heavy weapons and do tons of damage and basically be really annoying to take down. Another concern at this point is the dreadful AI of the people who are supposed to be helping me. They hide behind a rock or just sort of stand around doing nothing, not even pretending to fight. Also, the opponents aren't making any attempt to get at them, they are strictly trying to get at me. Now there's kind of a story reason for that that we'll see a bit later on, or that might potentially excuse it anyway, but I can't help but think this is just really bad AI basically. Anyway, Vala and Bast both die after the fight and Aloy is the only one left standing. Once this boring fight is over, Aloy finds that the men were equipped with focus devices like hers. A mystery man sneaks up and is about to kill her when Rost saves the day. The cultists want to hide all trace that they were here, so they figure a good way to be subtle will be to blow up the place. Not sure I entirely understand that logic, but whatever. Rost pushes Aloy off the cliff as he tells her to survive and then is promptly blown up. I wasn't expecting him to die this quickly, and nor was I expecting to have such a strong reaction to such a predictable event. It was so obvious this was going to happen, but I thought it was going to be a bit later on in the story. It happened really soon, and yet it still got to me a bit. Now the body can't be identified, so I guess there is a chance that Rost is still alive, but if he is we don't see him in this game. Perhaps that's what the sequel was for. At this point in the story we don't actually know why Rost was an outcast like Aloy. However, later in the game if we question Tirsa about it we can find out. Years ago Rost had a mate and a child. A group of bandits attacked the Nora and kidnapped his child and killed his mate. Rost goes after the bandits with the Nora Braves, but they can't get close without the bandits killing more hostages. Eventually the bandits just kill the hostages anyway, including Rost's daughter, and they leave the bodies just outside the Nora sacred lands. That means the Nora can't even go there to collect the bodies, they've just got to leave them there, in sight and rotting. Rost asks the matriarchs for permission to become a death seeker. They grant him permission and Rost undergoes a ritual which supposedly takes his spirit from his body. His body is now just a shell so the body can leave the sacred lands and get his revenge. He kills all the bandits and tries to come back towards the sacred land. He knows he can't come back so he just basically collapses near the border. Another Nora, and we're not told who because I, I did wonder if it was Tirsa but I don't think it is. Another Nora leaves the Sacred Lands and basically sort of drags him back in and brings him back to the Matriarchs. The Matriarchs permit him to stay on the Sacred Lands so long as he accepts being an outcast for the rest of his life. Believe it or not, this is actually considered an act of generosity. Clearly Tirsa retains a soft spot for Rost because she later entrusts him with Aloy when she's born. As you might expect, Aloy survives the fall and wakes up in the Sacred Mountain, which is supposed to be out of bounds for everyone except the Matriarchs. 
Aloy examines the focus device she found on one of the attackers and finds out that she was actually the target. They were watching her through Olin's focus. After speaking to Tirsa, you also find out that the Nora war party died in large numbers after they went after the attackers. Tirsa then decides she's going to show you the place where you were born. Sort of. Tirsa reveals that you were found by the matriarchs as a gift from the goddess, or a curse from the goddess depending on who you ask. As Aloy points out, But this isn't a goddess. Aloy! It's a door. With people behind it. The door scans Aloy and states that she is a 99.47 DNA match, however the door cannot be opened until the corruption is cleansed. Aloy has no clue what this means, but she quickly decides that she needs to track down Olin to unravel the mystery. The matriarchs make Aloy a seeker, which means she can leave the sacred lands and go to Meridian where she expects to find Olin. She can actually pretty much just go wherever she wants now. I'm not sure why they couldn't have just made Ross the normal seeker back in the day instead of that kind of special death seeker thing. Sure, he was on a death mission, but then it's not like Aloy keeps her hands clean in the rest of this game. Anyway, Aloy heads outside to a courtyard and meets up with Teb again. Teb explains that there's a new war chief called Rest in charge after Sona went missing chasing after the attackers as part of the war party. Rest won't open the gate for you because you're an outcast and because he's a piece of shit. This conversation and whole thing looks rather ridiculous given how easy it would be for Aloy to just jump over the wall, but in video games there's usually a reason for things like this and sure enough a corrupted machine that the Nora call a demon suddenly heads towards the camp and brings a load of corrupted striders with it. The demon is later revealed to be called a corrupter, surprisingly enough, and it can handle itself in a fight. My initial tactic was to try and stay at range, but the corrupter quickly started flinging boulders at me. Fortunately after I'd killed it, it left behind a device that enables Aloy to take control of other machines. After this fight, Aloy is now free to leave the mountain and wander where she pleases as a seeker. The open world is now yours to explore. Horizon's first act does a great job of setting up a compelling story that pushes you forward into its open world. The gameplay is lacking, but fortunately I already know that act two more than makes up for that. Before we get into the nuts and bolts of the gameplay, I just wanna take a few minutes to discuss why I think this opening act works so well for an open world game like this. On its face, the story perhaps bears a passing resemblance to that of Fallout 4. After all, we've got a post-apocalyptic world, you're looking for a family member, albeit your mum and not your son. However, you know, there's definitely some similarities here. That said, whereas I hated Fallout 4's story with a passion for many reasons, Horizon avoids one of that game's obvious pitfalls. It's a phrase I'm loath to use here because it's been thrown around a lot in recent years and is on the verge of becoming cliche. It's also one of those things people just sound to say cleverer than they are, really. I'm going to say it anyway, but only once. Lunar narrative dissonance. There we go. It's just a fancy way of saying that the gameplay doesn't match the story. In Fallout 4, you play as a father or a mother who wakes up from being cryogenically frozen for over 200 years. You woke up while you were cryogenically frozen and saw your son get kidnapped, so of course you set out to find him as soon as you can. However, then, you know, perhaps you bump into a farmer having a red roach problem and you agree to help him out. And then you hear about some ghouls terrorising a neighbourhood not so far away, so, you know, of course you do the honourable thing and go and kill them. Oh, and then the Minutemen need your help to rebuild their faction. And the Railroad wants you to help since. And the Brotherhood of Steel could use your help too, and there are some droids who want to fly an old ship to freedom. And the list just goes on and on. As a player, I never cared much about my son in Fallout 4 because I had no relationship to him. I only saw him for a few seconds before the bomb dropped, and then again as he was kidnapped. In the entire time I saw him, he was just kind of like wrapped up in a blanket and just looked like a big blob. The player character, on the other hand, should of course have an intense burning passion to get his son back. He would never stop along the way to, for example, rebuild a settlement that no one else has bothered to touch for 200 years. The disconnect between the player and the character is so strong that at one point, without realising it, I actually left Massachusetts and travelled up to Maine, doing the Far Harbour DLC, and had to, at one point I stopped and realised that, hang on, I'm helping some parents find their adult daughter who voluntarily left home before I'm finding my own young son who has been kidnapped. I could talk for an hour or probably more about the problems of Fallout 4 story and that's not even getting into its gameplay, which is equally bad but that's one of its biggest problems. Horizon doesn't share this issue. Aloy wants to find her mum, of course, and she wants to uncover the mystery of her birth, but so does the player. It's really intriguing, I wanna know what happened. 
I care about who Aloy's mum is, and I want to find out what's going on in the world. Furthermore, there's no reason to believe Aloy's mum is actually in any immediate danger. So, you know, if, I, if Aloy stops to help other people, then it doesn't feel unnatural or take away from the main quest. It's simply a thing that Aloy is doing and I, as the player, am choosing to do because Aloy is a good person. Narratively, it makes sense. Later on in the story, there is more urgency and at one point we do get a bit of a disconnect between Aloy needing to act quickly and me wandering around picking up metal flowers. However, that's later in the game. For now, I'll simply say that the first act is an excellent introduction to Aloy the world and the journey she has to go on. It's not particularly fun to play, mind you, but there's enough teasers of what we're going to get. Once Aloy has defeated those corrupted machines and left the mountain, the game opens up a lot and leaves you just to explore. We're now in the middle act and in my opinion the story just becomes a lot less interesting than just playing the game and exploring the world. I think this is probably a good time to go through all the various types of non-essential missions you can go on and boxes you can check off. You can't do them all yet but you know like within a couple of hours all these checklists start to appear so like you might as well just talk about it now. As you can see on the quest screen, in addition to main quests, there are side quests, errands, bandit camps, tall necks, cauldrons, corrupted zones, hunting grounds, and tutorials. It's a pretty daunting list, and when I first saw it, it brought back all those fears I had about a padded open world. I think I mentioned before, like, I just, I'm not a fan of these open worlds with just a ton of pointless crap to do. Fortunately, it's nowhere near as bad as it looks. I'll discuss the side quests more later. They tend to be pretty substantial, and they tie into the main quest. To keep it brief, I'll just say this. These are side quests in the mould of Witcher 3. I wouldn't say this one has the emotional depth of Bloody Baron from that game, for example, but they are the consistently high quality. It's pretty good stuff. The errands are exactly as they sound. I, I actually really appreciate that Gorilla is just recognising these for what they are and being upfront about it. Yeah, they're fetch quests, basically. Or maybe sort of hunt and go find someone quests. There's minimal story to go along with it. Um, the only ones worth going into detail about are actually part of the Hunting Lodge story, which I'll talk about more later. The tall necks are Horizon's equivalent of Ubisoft's towers. Climbing to the top of one of these huge sort of Diplodocus type creatures and then scanning them gives you information about your surroundings and it defogs the map. Tall necks are completely harmless and they're a wonder to behold. Their feet have these individual toes that I had to sort of stop and stare at a few times. It's pretty incredible as they put their foot down on the ground, you see all the toes move, it's really cool. As I mentioned, I'm not a fan of open world gimmicks, and they've sort of taken over games in the last decade, I really don't like it. Tornix would typically fall into that category, but I will say Gorilla does do a job of making these a little bit more interesting than your typical tower, Ubisoft tower, whatever you want to call it. The Tornix themselves are easy enough to climb, but getting to them is the tricky part. You'll need a sort of high jumping off point and then getting to that is difficult because it's surrounded by bandits or aggressive machines or something like that. Most of them are actually quite hard and I think even in one of the early ones I had to get past loads of like aggressive snap moors and glint hawks and stuff so you can never really take them for granted. Fortunately there's only five tall necks in the entire game, like six if you count one that's kind of part of the main story. So you don't really have a chance to get bored with these. I still think the fog thing is a gimmick though, like I, why not defog the map's topography to begin with but then have Tornex reveal information about what is dotted around on that map. Talking of the map, just as a small aside, it's actually 3D, it's sort of. If you look at it closely you can see the layers and it tells you where the ground is high and where the ground is low, that can occasionally be useful. Cauldrons give you a tangible reward for completion but unfortunately they don't live up to their potential. There are four cauldrons dotted around the map and completing them gives your spear the ability to override certain types of machine and then have them fight by your side. Or in a more basic example you can override charges and use them as like a horse basically. We'll see that soon in the story. Three of the four cauldrons are in quite secure areas that only Aloy can access thanks to her DNA match which we find out more about later. Uh, there are a few machines in these cauldrons and some really light puzzles. It kind of reminds me of the tombs in the recent Tomb Raider games. They look stunning. They're underground, but they're actually modern and appear to be working factories of some kind. We do find out what they are later. I keep saying that, but the cauldrons are kind of tied into the big mystery, so it's something we don't really know about at this point. The cauldrons have a lot of potential, but in the end they're really underbaked. 
The combat is nothing that you don't do above ground, so it's almost sort of pointless having it in here. And the puzzles are frustratingly basic for the most part. It really is really simple stuff. I mean, to be honest, it's more challenging to get some of the, like, collectibles than it is to complete these cauldrons. And there's nothing you don't do above ground, really. I did manage to get stuck on one section because I don't think the game clearly communicated that if you shot this sort of spinning cog that it would turn the other way. So I did get stuck for a little bit, I suppose. Um, but other than that, these are really quite simple. They pale in comparison to the tombs in Rise of the Tomb Raider, which I think they're trying to imitate. At the end of the cauldron, you'll face off against one of the machines that you want to gain the ability to override. One of the cauldrons is a little different because its access point is out in the open and there's humans in there as well as machines. To be honest, I've rarely used the override abilities in the game and so I didn't. not only did I not get much enjoyment from the cauldrons, I didn't get much benefit from completing them anyway. I'd say you can skip these without losing any sleep, but if you're struggling with the game, then maybe try and sort of go into these cauldrons and gain those override abilities, because I'm sure if you use them, they can actually help turn the tide of battle. They do feel like a bit of a lost opportunity, though. When I stepped inside the first cauldron, I expected the puzzles to be more significant, and maybe even hoped for some story reveals or a bit of background lore, but to be honest, they all look largely the same. When you've seen one, you've seen them all. That would be fine if the puzzle sections were fun, but we've got no satisfying puzzles and no story information and really limited combat. So, so yeah, what's the point? <laughs> Unless you're into overriding machines, you don't need to bother with them. Early on in your travels, you meet a man named Neil. He has a passion for killing bandits and asks you to help him out. I really wish I shared his passion. Unfortunately, I found the bandit camps pretty boring. I won't dwell on this too much here because I'm going to talk about combat a bit later, but... Suffice to say that, you know, you do your best to sneak around and when that eventually fails, as it almost certainly will, then you just fire a load of arrows at people's heads. There's no real reward apart from the satisfaction of killing the bandits, which might be enough for Neil, but it isn't for me. The best bit is when all the bandit camps have been cleared out and Neil decides that he wants to fight you to the death because he's bored. You don't have to do it, but yeah, he, he really seems quite serious about it. Corrupted zones are another chore to tick off and not much thought has been put into them. You go to a place on the map and fight three or four corrupted machines. Corrupted machines are slightly more powerful and erratic versions of the normal ones. Each area has a recommended level and if you do them in line with that level then these fights can be pretty challenging, especially if you aren't able to take on the machines one at a time. The XP rewards are really generous so to be honest that's the main motivation for doing them. I'm not entirely sure how these corrupted zones came about. You often see visible corruption in the environment, but I'm not sure if that's the cause of the corrupted machines here or if it's a side effect of them. I know that the machines are corrupted by the corruptors and some humans control the corruptors, but I'm not sure how these machines just ended up randomly wandering around here in these zones. I don't know if they've just been forgotten about or what. You might want to do the corrupted zones for the XP you get out of them and also to make sure you don't accidentally stumble into one when you're not paying attention. You won't gain anything of note though. Speaking of XP gains, the hunting grounds are a great way to level up early in the game, so long as you're high enough level to take on the challenges to begin with. The hunting grounds are small areas run by a member of the hunting lodge and they provide you with an opportunity to test your skills in time challenges for the chance to earn a blazing sun. Like the hunting Olympics, I guess, because there's a bronze and silver award as well. The first hunting ground was moderately interesting, but it didn't inspire me to do any of the others until the end of the game. I have to say, actually, I missed out. The hunting grounds teach you the best way to take down certain enemy types, and they teach you new techniques. They would have been really useful to do earlier in the game. Unfortunately, the first one you come across isn't really all that useful, so I thought the challenges were just a random distraction. For example, in the first one, we lay a few trip wires, shoot canisters on machines' backs, and get the chance to crush machines under logs. We've already been shown how to lay trip wires, and we know we can shoot canisters for additional damage. All this challenge really teaches us is that we can spook machines and make them run into traps. Using logs to crush enemies is definitely effective if you get it right, but I never really found a use for it out in the wild. It's a shame these first set of hunting ground challenges weren't better because they're actually genuinely useful in improving your ability to take on machines efficiently instead of just firing tear arrows at them like I did all the time. When you've earned a complete set of blazing suns, you can take them to the hunting lodge to get some special rare weapons with bonus attributes. I'm not sure I can say these bonus weapons are essential because you kind of need really good weapons to get the blazing sun awards in the first place. 
You end up probably being more cool alternatives to use with slightly different attributes and a flashy bit of gold on them. I'm not sure I can say they're necessary, but they're definitely not pointless either. Lastly, we have tutorials. Talk about an afterthought. When you get a new weapon type or an upgraded version of the weapon, you can complete a basic task for some XP. For example, trip three enemies with shock wires or pin three enemies down with a rope caster. Sounds easy enough. The reason I never bothered with these is that you actually have to select them as an active quest for the kills to count. Even though you can complete the challenge anywhere on the map, if you don't have the tutorial quest selected, then you don't get credit for it. I just could not be bothered to keep switching between the active quest and the tutorial. I might be on a quest and then wandering around and see a bunch of watchers that I need to tie down, for example. So that's great. Um, but then I have to go into the menu and select the right tutorial before I do it. I remember then I got two out of the three of them and I think the other got spooked off or something. So then I had to go back to the main quest and remember to go back to my tutorial the next time I saw a watcher who I might be able to tie down. And it's a hassle, it's boring and the XP isn't worth it even at the lower levels. Okay, by the time you've experimented with all of these possible alternative quests, the cauldrons, the tool necks, all that sort of stuff, you're going to have fought a huge variety of machines and you probably have got a good idea for how things work. As you've seen, Aloy can scan machines with her focus to get information about the machine's weak spots and then figure out how best to attack them. Different machines have different weaknesses, so before long you're going to need much more than just that basic bow and trip caster that you had at the beginning of the game. This is probably a good time to look at the weapons because although there aren't that many, they are actually a decent variety in here. There are seven types of weapons to choose from, but unfortunately the limited weapon wheel only lets you keep four on the go at one time. This means you're likely to sort of pick your favourites and stick to them, which is a real shame. I think you should probably use a mixture to get the best results, but the problem with that is constantly sort of pressing the touchpad and then going to the weapon selection screen and selecting your favourite weapon and putting it into one of the slots on the wheel, going back out to the game and then selecting it, it all sort of spoils the flow of combat. I really think they could use a larger weapon wheel. I mean, I think we've got seven weapons here in total. I'm sure you could get seven on the wheel. Even if you just stuck to six and left one out, I'm sure that would be fine. The recent Doom reboot managed to fit a lot of weapons on. I mean, I think there was a, I think there was 10 weapons in Doom. So if they can do that in that game, I feel like Horizon should be able to as well. One thing that could make it a little bit more complicated is all the different ammo types. It would get a little bit messy because you're not just selecting your bow, you're selecting the type of ammo you want to use in the bow as well. That could probably be solved by having like a, you know, you choose your weapon and then there's like a second radial where you choose the type of ammo to go in the weapon or something like that. I, I really don't believe there's not a way that you could do this better. This radial is also where you'll craft ammo on the fly, so you just sort of select the type of ammo you want and hold down X. Time slows down as you're doing this and it's an incredibly quick process, so although it sounds cumbersome, it actually is not much of a problem. I don't think I can blame it for any deaths in fights, to be honest. It looks bad, but actually it's all pretty easy to do. You start off with a reduced ammo capacity, but you will see that you can increase that later on. It's important that you can deal a variety of damage on the go, so you need a decent mix of stuff. My preferred mix was the typical hunter bow which came with normal arrows and fire arrows at the start and for most of the game and then a sharp shot bow which is basically for long range damage and for tearing off armour. These tear arrows are absolutely brilliant, I'll show you more of them later. I also used a sling to do elemental damage quickly and then would either have a trip caster or a rope launcher in the fourth slot. Like I say, ideally I would have at least all of those five on the go and actually there's a couple more weapons that we'll get to that I actually wanted to use as well but just couldn't. Once I saw new weapons being sold it actually didn't take me long to get the resources to buy better versions and, and get the new ones I wanted so I'm not going to dwell too much on the basic models that you get at the beginning because you actually pretty quickly upgrade to the ultra rare sort of purple weapons. In fact I played the entire second half of the game with pretty much the same weapons I think. There are three types of bow available. The hunter bow is what I consider to be the sort of basic all-rounder. You can get shots off really quickly if you want and it can shoot fire arrows. Fire arrows are probably the most useful type of elemental damage, a lot of machines are weak to this. I use this bow the most. The sharp shot bow is great for popping off enemies from a distance. What you notice though is it takes longer to aim it accurately. Usually the longer you hold down the trigger button the more damage you do with um, a bow and arrow shot for example but in this game it's actually about accuracy so if you try and get shots off quickly with a sharp shot bow 
they'll just go all over the place. So you don't want to do that. That means, of course, that once enemies get close up, you're going to want to switch over to something else, probably the Hunter Bow. The Sharpshot Bow is incredibly useful against machines, though, because of its tear arrows. Those things are seriously incredible. If you hit a piece of weapon or, an, or armor with these tear arrows, then there's a decent chance you'll blow that clean off. In the case of weapons, you can actually pick up the weapon that you've blown off and use it against the machine. Finally, the war bow fires off all different types of elemental damage. I never actually used this weapon, I instead I had my sling do the elemental damage. The problem is not the bow itself, it's the fact that you have to sacrifice something else. There's no way I want to sacrifice my basic bow because I have loads of arrows for it and that's never a problem. It can also do fire damage, get shots off really quickly, that sort of thing. And I'm not going to replace my sharp shot bow because of the tear arrows it has and also its ability to sort of headshot enemies from a distance. So yeah, the war bow might have been cool, but I never actually got to use it. The sling is the quickest way to shock, freeze or set fire to an enemy. If you find a machine vulnerable to ice, then sling a few ice bombs at them and get in close once they're frozen up. If you shoot something that'll be explosive, you can get a really quick kill and this is by far the best way of killing the rock breakers. Rock breakers, in my opinion, are actually the toughest enemy in the game because they sort of go underground and then chase you and just pop up and get you. You have very little chance to dodge these things. However, if you're able to freeze them, they've uh, they've got like something under their belly which can basically blown up once you've frozen them and it's almost an instant kill, I think. It must take at least half of their health bar. My fourth weapon is either usually the rope caster or the trip caster, depending on my mood and the circumstances. The trip caster was great at the beginning when like watchers were taking preordained paths and stuff, but as I moved on in the game, I probably used the rope caster a bit more. It's especially useful for dealing with glint hawks or anything that flies. If you fire a couple of ropes, which is easier said than done, you might be able to bring them down out of the air. And once they're out of the air, you can set fire to them, get in for critical hits, that kind of stuff. The tear blaster weapon has awesome potential. It seems to let you sort of blow off armor at close range. You don't really have to aim it as much as sort of point at a machine and fire. Uh, unfortunately, like it isn't as flexible. Like The sharpshot bow can tear off armor and also do damage from long range, whereas this is specifically for tearing off armor. So again, it became a case of like, what do I replace to use this? And I didn't want to replace anything, so I didn't use it. The final weapon is the Rattler, which I literally never used. I had to go back into the game, buy one, and then use it to record footage for this video. I just, it looks cool for close range combat, but again, like I didn't know what other weapon to replace. I might well have used it if the weapon wheel had been bigger, but like I say, it wasn't. And I really do think that's a big mistake in a game where you're encouraged to use different weapons and different types of damage and that kind of stuff. Each weapon only has three different levels, so don't expect to stumble across awesome weapons as loot as you explore the world. As you upgrade your weapon, it will gain additional ammo types and a new modification slot up to a maximum of three. The modifications are actually the main way you do additional damage. I don't think there's any increase to the amount of damage you do with the better bows. It just allows you to put more modifications on them. The modifications themselves also come in three types of rarity, with purple being the rarest. So that's the same for weapons, armor, and mods. Once fitted, the modification cannot be taken back out and used elsewhere unless you have what's called the Tinker perk. I strongly recommend getting that perk because otherwise you're in that kind of situation of, do I put this really good mod in this bow and then replace the bow and then not be able to use the mod again? And it's kind of annoying. Although that said, by the end of the game, you know, you'll be pissing mods. It's just ridiculous. You don't need them. The mods will enhance your handling, raw damage, tear or elemental abilities. If you have that tinker perk, then technically every battle you go into, you can mix up the different types of damage or elemental abilities or whatever to be suitable for each enemy type. But that is a real hassle. It, again, it's like changing out the weapons on the weapon wheel all the time. I just can't be bothered to go to that much effort for each additional fight. I went for the all round approach to give myself the best shot in the majority of circumstances. And I tended to favor tear damage because I really like being able to get the armor off machines. Aloy's armor works in much the same way as weapons. The better the armor, the more mods you can put on it, and then the more protection you'll get. And again, you have to choose between different types of protection. So do you want to be protected against certain elements like fire, ice, shock? Or do you want to be protected against melee attacks or ranged attacks or whatever? So again, I chose one piece of gear and stuck with it. And I think I went for general sort of melee protection because again, like I think you need melee protection all the time, whereas you might only need shock protection when you're going up against one of the flying enemies that does shock damage. Uh, whereas like melee is much more common. So I didn't want to mix and match all the time. So I went for the all round approach. Horizon has tons of loot for you to collect, but this is one area where I don't think Horizon knocks it out of the park. 
I only wore four different outfits the entire game. One right at the start, which is obviously mandatory. One I bought very early on. And the other I bought about halfway through after sort of saving up and going out of my way to get a few different specific types of, uh, I think it was like a snap jaw heart or something. And then I would have kept that for the entire game if it weren't for a special armor set I found near the end. I'll talk a bit more about that later because there's a whole sort of mission involved for that. Similarly with the weapons, you're not really going to change them around all that much. You're going to develop a style and probably stick to it, which means I feel bad for sort of avoiding what I think is quite a big part of the game, but I just couldn't be bothered to keep switching them in and out. So you'll get tons of loot, but all it is is metal shards, which are the currency, and then kind of other bits that you can use for crafting different arrow types. If you loot enemies after battle, you're probably always going to be okay for arrows. And if you go out of your way like a little bit, then you'll be able to get the types of bow and armor and stuff that you need. But it's never very exciting because you know that when you go up to an enemy, you're probably just going to get the basic stuff. And even if you do get something cool, like a heart from a machine is considered pretty good. You know, the chances of you actually needing that specific heart for something are quite rare. So I wouldn't find the loot very exciting, to be honest. I'm sure other players make the most of these options. And I guess if you do it on the harder difficulty, you really have to get used to sort of using the best weapon for the job. Okay, so once you're equipped with a couple of decent bows and a sling and all that sort of stuff, you're equipped, you're ready to take on the machines. Now in an ideal world, you'd probably sneak up on each new enemy type, analyze them with the focus and figure out where their weaknesses are. That's great in theory, but you might not always be afforded that privilege. However, as long as you can get a quick scan on them, you can just sort of pause the game and view the machine in the machine catalog. Machines are split into four groups, acquisition, reconnaissance, combat and transport. I will discuss the purpose of the machines a bit later in this story and that will sort of make sense then. The most basic machines such as watchers, grazers and chargers have a couple of obvious weak spots and no powerful weapons. They attack with what might be generously described as melee combat, but basically they just run into you and flail limbs at you, whatever they might be. These machines are pretty easy to kill, you can just sort of dodge their charge and get a few shots off, dodge again, etc. But if you get outnumbered you're going to be in trouble. That can always be a reminder of how tough the game can be, like even when you're quite a high level, if you stumble into an area with loads of charges, you can suddenly get beat up pretty bad. If you do approach a large group, then it's definitely best to be stealthy and thin the herd a bit if you can by doing sort of stealth attacks from the long grass and stuff like that. But it's not rocket science generally, you, you need to hit the big yellow bits and try to avoid getting a hit yourself. Things get much more interesting when you encounter the machines that are built specifically for combat. So there are snap moors, which are essentially kind of crocodiles with like a freeze breath thing. Then there's bellow backs, which can breathe fire or ice like a dragon and do an absolute ton of damage if you get caught in that. Or there's the thunder jaw, which is probably the most visually impressive machine and one of the toughest to fight. That's the one that you've probably seen on the cover. It looks kind of a bit like a T-Rex, but without the little arms. Facing these enemies taught me a couple of techniques that I ended up sticking with for most of the game. Enemies like snap moor are often vulnerable to fire. In fact, most enemies are vulnerable to fire in one way or another, even the ones that actually breathe it themselves, which seems a bit counterintuitive. If you can shoot enough fire arrows at them, then they will actually catch on fire and start taking damage over time. They also tend to be a bit easier to hit during this stage, so this will be when I sort of try and attack weak spots with my strongest arrows. If necessary, I'll also get the armor off with tear arrows, or maybe shoot off their deadliest weapons and that kind of thing. The Thunderjaw, for example, has some really powerful weapons on its back. You will get cut to shreds in seconds if you try to take these guys on one on one. Uh, keeping your distance doesn't really work at this stage unless you just want to constantly roll around and never have time to get a shot off. However, these weapons actually give you an opportunity. If you shoot a tear arrow at the weapon, then the gun will probably get torn off. And not only does the machine have one less way to attack you, you can also use the gun and attack the machine with it. You can literally beat the machines at their own game, it's pretty damn satisfying. During early combat I would try to keep my distance and pick off shots from long range. Even when I did take cover, that cover would likely get destroyed by the machines. And in fact there's some great environmental damage which I didn't really appreciate fully until I went back and looked at parts of this video, but the machines really will sort of knock down trees and boulders and things that are in your way. In addition to charging at you, they could actually like throw rocks at you and jump in your direction and stuff like that. So you're never actually safe even when you're from a distance, if they've spotted you that is. And they do spot you pretty quickly after you hit them. You're going to spend a lot of time rolling around in a desperate panic, which is actually a good way to avoid most projectiles and charging enemies. 
In fact, I would say that this rolling is a little bit overpowered in a way. Like once you learn that just to roll into enemies to miss their attacks, then you're going to be able to sort of avoid taking damage in most circumstances. Like if an enemy is jumping at you, the worst thing you can do is jump away because they will probably still land on you. But if you jump towards them, then you know, you'll probably go underneath. Similarly with a charge, if you kind of jump towards them, their charge doesn't really make contact. I would change things up occasionally, of course. Like as I mentioned, if you freeze certain enemies, you can do additional damage with your arrows and you might be able to blow up a weak point for really, really good damage. I have to say though, combat is tough. Like without even trying, I actually kept leveling up really quickly and I was a little bit worried at one point that I was going to make the game too easy on myself. The main mission that I had to take on might be say level 15 and I was already level 25 and I hadn't even been grinding at all, I hadn't even really been trying to level up. However, I really didn't need to worry. You can never take victory for granted against the machines, especially if there's more than one of them to tackle at the time. Usually it feels fair. It shouldn't be easy to take on a machine like a Thunderjaw. It's got two cannons, a strong tail, and it can do all sorts of damage. The only time it doesn't really feel fair is the airborne enemies. They seem to be able to do a disproportionate amount of damage to you. It reminds me a bit of dogs in games like Bloodborne and Fallout. In those games, for example, I don't feel like a dog should be able to do that much damage to me when I'm quite capable of taking on like much bigger monstrosities, and yet they can be a real pain in the ass when they attack. Similarly, these like glint hawk things, they don't look like they should be that deadly, but they are an absolute nightmare. Partly because the camera is really bad and they become really difficult to hit. They'll attack in packs and fire ice projectiles at you in the case of the glint hawks. And there seems, I think there's a bit of projectile tracking here as well, and the hit detection seems a bit off. Like quite often I was rolling and would still take damage even though I'm sure I'm not getting hit. I would say other than the two airborne enemies, the machines are really enjoyable to fight. Even though I didn't vary my technique that much, even that right at the end of the game it was still satisfying to hear a tear arrow rip armour and weapons from the machines. I'd say my favourite fight was when I went one on one with a Thunderjaw that I came across in the wild. I died a couple of times to this guy and I was probably under leveled at this point, but when I was fighting him I did enough damage that I knew I could defeat him at some point. I kept trying and would fire arrows at him until he was bare of all his armour and weapons. Uh, at that point I grabbed one of the disc cannons and just ripped him to shreds. Of course this coincided with my capture card fucking up so I can't actually show you the one time that happened but I think I've got some footage where I took on a similar opponent in similar circumstances. It was a really memorable moment for me though, so I'm sure you have moments of your own like this when you're playing the game. Adding to the difficulty of these fights is the really bizarre health system. Aloy's health doesn't regenerate, which I'm fine with in principle, but it's weird that you've got two different ways to heal. You have your sort of medicine pouch thing, which you activate by pressing up on the D-pad, and that sort of slowly regenerates your health over time, or you can get health potions and you can get them in sort of small or large sizes. And you can also create health potions as well. You'll need to constantly fill up the medicine pouch by collecting herbs as you walk around the environment, which is really tedious. Uh, and the medicine pouch also doesn't heal you instantly, it's that kind of trickle effect over time. That's okay at the beginning of the game, but near the end you just cannot use it efficiently because you're taking such much, so much damage at one time that having this kind of slow regeneration of health is just not going to do it for you. If you get hit again while that's happening, you're going to die. That means I soon came to rely on potions, and often large ones, because I would die while that medicine pouch was taking effect. That's especially the case against machines, I suppose a medicine pouch is more useful in fighting humans, which perhaps is what the two different things are meant for, but like I say, it seems odd to have these two systems. Like, if you're going to say that Aloy needs to collect medicinal herbs to heal herself, but then also give her big potions that work in a completely different way, that sounds kind of odd to me, it's almost like you can't make either system work and so you've just shoved both of them in there. Talking about fighting humans, when you do that you're either going to be facing bandits or the eclipse. I've not really talked about the Eclipse yet, but we'll see later on that they're effectively a splinter group of the Shadow Carja. So basically just a more organised version of bandits really. As I've already suggested, the combat against human opponents is boring throughout the entire game. Gorilla wants you to feel free to choose between a stealthy approach and all out action, but neither really work and neither are really that exciting. The stealth is limited and you never really feel stealthy, you just feel like you're breaking the game all the time. Metal Gear Solid 5 has its problems, but after you've played that, it's really hard to go back to games like this where stealth consists of hiding, and you know, I think I'd need to put air quotes around that because you're really not hiding, but anyway, hiding in long grass, then using uh, the lure, which is basically just a whistle, to attract an enemy over to you, doing a really elaborate stealth kill, which should raise the attention of anyone nearby, 
um, and then hiding back in the grass where no one notices. And then another enemy will probably notice the body, walk up to it, so you kill them, and then another enemy might notice, so they walk up to it and you kill them. And then if no enemies come over, then you whistle for another one. And that works for machines as well. You can whistle for machines. And it just is really tedious. The bandit camps are probably the worst culprits. There's actually an alarm in these camps, but the bandits will only raise the alarm if they definitively spot you. So no matter how many dead bodies they find littered around, they will only ever just look at the body and then get on with their patrol. In fact, while they're looking at the body, you can usually kill them because they stay still for a nice amount of time. It really is an absurd system. And like I say, you do not feel stealthy. You just kind of feel like you're breaking the game. I would remove the bandit camps entirely. Not only are they not necessary, I think they actually break the narrative slightly. The world of Horizon, or at least the part of it we see here, is split very much into tribes. Those tribes are developed enough that you can believe them they're working communities that allow people to sort of survive and flourish. That's not easy to convey in a video game featuring a post-apocalyptic world, and I think Horizon does a really good job. These bandit camps are dotted around the world, but they're within the land sort of owned or whatever by other tribes, and we've already seen that the Nora have a war tribe, and I'm sure the Karja do too, so why wouldn't those tribes just sort of go and clear out these bandit camps? It just doesn't really feel like they would survive separately on their own like this. And anyway, even if it's not breaking the narrative, I just did not get any enjoyment from them, so I just think they could be scrapped and no one would care. I'd say the fights against the Eclipse in the main story are more scripted, and they're actually more fun as a result. They resemble the fights in Uncharted 4 in that there's a kind of a certain approach you're supposed to go from. You start in one position, obviously, and need to get to the end, and that actually allows the fights to flow in a way that I don't think happens in the bandit camps. The bandit camps you can approach from potentially any angle, and depending on which way you come at it, you might not be able to do stealth at all. I still don't enjoy these fights against the Eclipse, mind you. They all follow the same pattern. You stay stealthy for as long as you can, and when all goes to shit, as it eventually will if you're me, you take out the guy with a heavy gun and then run to the gun, pick it up, and kill the rest of everyone there. There has to be a better approach to this. Fighting against the machines requires thought and planning. If you make a mess of it, then you're in real trouble. The fights versus humans should go one of two ways in my opinion. You should either have to be stealthy because you're vulnerable and there's a lot of people around and you know you'll quickly get gunned down. In that case there should be a developed stealth system and not one less substantial than what it was in Metal Gear Solid on the original PlayStation. Alternatively, Gorilla could use these fights to make Aloy feel like a badass. Take stealth off the table entirely and have the player expected to take on everyone with quick shooting and decent melee combat. Even half decent melee combat would be an improvement on what we've got here. As it stands, you typically get to hit a human opponent once with your lance, and then they block the rest of the attacks and will eventually attack you. After that point, you can hit them again, and so on. I know this type of combat isn't the bread and butter of the game, but that doesn't mean it can't be improved. Like I said, I think actually just making it kind of easy might work here. We've, we've still got the fights against the machines that can be a challenge, so fighting against the humans can almost just be a chance to let loose and do loads of really cool stuff. At the moment it just feels so underbaked that I just don't enjoy it at all. I would say it's no better than what was in, say, Shadow of Mordor, and that game's a couple of years old now. It's the area of the game that it's clearly had the least time spent on it, and you can really tell. The AI in particular is just is dire, basically. Every time you reach a new level, up to a maximum of 50, you'll gain a new skill point and a few additional health points. You'll also gain a skill point for completing main story quests and some of the substantial side quests. In other words, the skill points keep flowing. Destroying machines grants a generous amount of XP, so you'll quickly move up the levels and I often found I had 4 or 5 skill points to spend without even noticing it. Another reason I didn't notice it is because the skill points aren't all that enticing. There's a skill tree split into three sections, Prowler, Brave, and Forager. Prowler focuses on stealth, Brave on direct combat, and Forager on survivability. You'll need to unlock some skills before acquiring others. It's a fairly standard skill tree as seen in many games these days. A couple of the skills are nearly essential though. I can't imagine playing the game without the ability to slow down time as I aim with my bow and arrow. Conversely, I never once needed to shoot anyone while balancing on a rope. Most of the skills are borderline useful, but few of them are actually that exciting. More than anything, I just felt that the skill should have been open from the beginning. In addition to slowing down time with your bow, you have to unlock basic stealth attacks and the ability to whistle from a bush, call a friendly charger to use for travel, and even a tinker perk to move around mods once you've attached them. 
If you want to be able to call a charger to use for travel whenever you want, you actually have to put a lot of points into that level. I ended up spending most of the game just running and fast traveling everywhere, even though I'd prefer to have used a charger. You can override one each time, but I just couldn't be bothered. If I could call one when I needed it, that would have been much more helpful. The skills are also weirdly spread out. I wanted to improve my concentration ability, but first I had to learn to move faster while carrying heavy weapons. I'm really not sure what the connection is between those two. It seems silly to make one dependent on the other. The skills mainly enhance damage on attacks, improve your concentration, and make Aloy harder to spot when moving. You don't really notice these improvements that much because as you get, you know, for example, harder to spot while moving and increased damage, the enemies are getting tougher anyway and they're getting more observant. You'd miss these things if you didn't have them, but they never actually make you feel like you're becoming this badass during the game. I'm actually not exaggerating when I say I hate the skill tree and leveling system in Horizon. I really genuinely hate it. I even have a solution for how to improve it. Just get rid of it. As I mentioned, the best skills were things that many other games unlock from the beginning. Can you imagine playing The Witcher 3 and not being able to whistle for Roach until later on in the game because you hadn't put a load of skill points into it? Doing a critical hit on a downed enemy is not something I should have to unlock. They're lying on the floor unconscious, why can't I go up there and give them a critical hit? Similarly, things like the whistle, concentration, shooting while on a rope, that can all be unlocked immediately. I actually propose removing the skill tree entirely and getting rid of the leveling system and just relying on weapons and armor to improve Aloy's damage output and hit points as the game progresses. As it stands, most damage dealt depends on your weapon and the mods attached to it. I don't really think my proposal would change all that much. With each level you gain some health, but that could easily be dealt with by having Aloy improve her armor instead. And that's kind of what you do, you get better mods and you can take more hit points. The leveling system fell out of place from the beginning. I barely noticed any difference in difficulty when tackling a mission above my current level or way below it. If you really want to fence players off from certain missions until they have more experience, then just have side characters recommend upgrading weapons and armor as appropriate. And if the player doesn't do that, then well, they're going to fail, and that's fine. I did fail in Horizon anyway, it's quite a difficult game. Horizon has a strong enough story and a solid enough gameplay experience that I don't think you need a gimmick of leveling up to keep players coming back for more. As it is, the inclusion feels underbaked and frustrating, not satisfying. A lot of the skills, especially in the Prowler perk, focus on crafting and loot gathering, so I guess I'd better discuss that part of the game now. And if you think listening to me talking about it is boring, just imagine how I feel playing it and doing it for hours on end. I really wish I didn't have to discuss crafting in this video, but Horizon is an open world game, so of course there's a crap ton of stuff to pick up and use for crafting or selling to traders. Yeah, it's safe to say that I hate crafting in games. I do you see the appeal on paper? I mean, if you're playing a game that involves you trying to survive in the wilderness, then sure. It's more realistic if the player has to collect materials to help them survive, be it parts for weapons or potions for survivability, whatever. Some things though are better left on paper. Collecting materials and crafting simply isn't fun in my opinion. I'm not trying to be controversial or offensive, but I genuinely don't understand how anyone can enjoy it. Maybe as a teenager with lots of time on my hands I would have been fine with the artificial extension of game time with, in this way, all the pointless collectathons and stuff. However, alas, I'm not a teenager anymore and I'm fairly certain I never will be again. Crafting in games is either a nightmare that slows the game down to a crawl and actively wastes the player's time as it does it, or it's just about bearable. Unfortunately, I suppose, Horizon is in the latter. It is bearable. As you walk around the world, you can't miss that little leaf symbol that identifies a plant that can be picked up for resources. It's most of them, actually. You'll also need to loot dead enemies. And if you're able to blow armor off the machines, then you'll be able to pick that up as well. After a big battle with humans and machines, the screen is practically full of these symbols. And if you have even the slightest collection tendencies, then you're going to waste time walking up to bodies, holding down triangle instead of pressing it, and then pressing triangle again to loot all the various metals, machine parts, or shards. Shards are Horizon's currency of choice. In addition to picking all this loot up that's out in the open, you'll also have to create your own. See all those foxes and boars wandering around? You need to shoot them for meat, skin and bones. You even need to kill fish for their bones and their skin. Annoyingly, for some reason, you don't get the skin and bones every time you kill a boar. I'm not too sure why, but sometimes you, know, you can only get the meat off of the boar, not the skin, not the bones. It doesn't really make any sense. Collecting loot in this way is always annoying. I think one minor way might be to, to improve it might be to have an option to just pick up all the loot that's on the ground after a battle, maybe like within a certain zone or a radius of the character, you can just have a hoover up loot button or something. But I still don't think it's a great thing to have in the game at all. 
Now you might be wondering if all this collecting is truly necessary. Can you just ignore it? Well, unfortunately it is necessary, kind of. At some point in the game I had to hunt out and collect pretty much every single resource on offer. That said, I didn't constantly need the stuff from dead animals, so my time hunting them was limited. I just did it when I needed to do it, basically. You will need wooden shards for arrows and certain plants to make fire arrows. Also, you'll need wire for the tear arrows, which are useful for getting armor off of machines. Okay, so if it's just that, I can live with it. That's not too bad, right? There is a decent argument for needing to craft arrows in the world of Horizon. After all, it would look a bit ridiculous if you just found arrows lying around everywhere, and having to buy them from merchants all the time would be pretty tedious. I'd be cool with unlimited ammo, but I get that that's an unusual approach. It's not something we get in many games, and it would probably put off a lot of gamers. Okay, so why not just collect what you need for the ammo? Well, you'd also need to pick up medicinal plants to fill your health meter. All of the plants have the same sign, so there's no way to know what you're getting until you're up close to it. For your reference, the red plants are the health. That's the easy way to remember. Okay, so that's ammo and health. What else do you need? Well, you'll also need to collect scrap from machines to sell and exchange for better weapons and armor. That comes in levels of rarity as well. So at a basic level, I think it's just scrap or something. And then the green level, which is kind of relatively common, is usually the eye of the machine. So like a watch eye or a snap more eye or something like that. The next level up is then a heart. So you might find like a charger heart. So the rarer and better the piece you find, the better the armor or weapon or whatever you can get in exchange for that piece. You might be wondering why I was going around killing animals. This is where we get to the real pain in the ass part, inventory management. If there's one thing I hate more than crafting in video games, it's inventory management. I will say I didn't always feel this way. I remember how in the original Resident Evil games you could only hold a limited quantity of items. That was a pain in the ass, but it actually added to the survival element of the game. You were just one police officer in a house. You could only hold a couple of weapons, limited ammo, and a few plants for your health. It roughly sort of matched what an actual human being might be able to carry. That's not the approach taken in Horizon, and to be fair to Gorilla, it's something endemic in games right now. Take Fallout 4, I just finished playing it relatively recently. In Fallout 4, you were actively encouraged to collect scrap everywhere you went. You could be used to build settlements, craft weapon mods, and food for keeping you alive, all that kind of stuff. And yet, despite the fact the game wanted you to pick up all this stuff, there was a strict limit on what you could carry. I spent more time figuring out which weapons to drop and which to go and store in my settlements and what to take with me than I did actually shooting ghouls and rad roaches. Fallout isn't going for realism with its inventory restrictions. You can carry at least 10 weapons, tons of armor sets, including heavy armor, you can carry nukes, cash registers, telephones, shit loads of stuff, like a thousand pieces of wood. However, there's still a limit to what you can carry. There's no point to this limit and it drives me absolutely nuts. Like Fallout 4, Horizon has a carry capacity and if you want to extend it beyond the measly starting point, then you'll need boar skins, fox skins, fish bones, and all that crap. Without extending the carry capacity, you'll quickly run out of space for mods and resources. With resources in particular, it's tough to know what's important and what should be kept. The game does tell you what each resource is used for, which I appreciate, but it's still hard to know whether I'll ever need it. And then just the way it's organized is weird. You can hold up to 50 of a certain thing in one slot. Like I think it's blaze canisters. You can hold 50 of them in one slot and you can hold, I don't know, like 10 snap more hearts. So if you're in a position where you pick up, I don't know, let's say you've got a carry capacity of 50 and you've got 49 things, you might be able to pick up like another 30 blaze canisters, but you can only pick up like one fox bone and then that's it. If you want to pick up the boar bone, you're kind of screwed. It's just like a really weird and arbitrary system. One final point I'll make on the crafting topic. Make sure you buy the unlimited fast travel pack. For some reason, Gorilla chose to make fast travel a consumable item. I don't really understand it. Most vendors sell this unlimited travel pack, so just pick it up as soon as you can. I think you need like a fox skin for it or something, and then a few other more common things. It's relatively easy to get as long as you make an effort to pick up the one item you need for it, or the major item you need. I'm all for exploring the world on foot, but as I mentioned before, you don't actually get to call on a charger until you've dumped a few skill points into that, and some quests require quite a hefty amount of backtracking. I ended up resorting to fast travel quite a lot, which I don't mind doing, that's fine. But yeah, make sure you get that unlimited fast travel pack. Otherwise, you'll run out of opportunities to fast travel. 
That said, this fast travel is not actually all that fast. The load time is much longer than the one after you die, and it's on par with the load times of Witcher 3, which maybe is why Gorilla didn't want you doing it all that much. Again, as with many things in Horizon, Gorilla generally does the best it can with the systems it put in place. I just kind of wish it didn't put those systems in place to begin with. Crafting sucks, but you are able to at least select what you need as an active quest, so if you want a foxbone, then you'll have that as a constant reminder. In some cases, it even points you to the general area where you might be able to get that item. It is easy to craft ammo in battle, so I can't complain too much about that, and later in the game, most of the common resources become available to purchase. This at least reduces the stress when deciding what to keep and what to leave behind. I don't have to worry about whether I should pick up that snap more heart when I know I can just buy it for a couple of hundred shards later. At that point I've got thousands of shards so that's not a problem. Still, Horizon would have been undeniably better without inventory management and I'm convinced the crafting requirement could have been reduced substantially and still have been just as efficient. Okay, all that talk about crafting and inventory management has left me a little depressed, so let's get back to the story. We left off with Aloy leaving the Sacred Mountain and free to explore as she chooses. So you can start by tackling some of the other objectives I discussed earlier, or follow the main quest, which requires you to go and test out that new override device you got off the Corruptor. Once you've tested the override device, you go and talk to Val and he'll give you directions to Meridian. He tells you to go and talk to Maria in Mother's Crown. At this point, it feels like you're being shunted from place to place a bit. I found it a little frustrating, but when you talk to Val, you kind of realise why. He's the son of the missing war chief Sona, and the brother of Vala, the girl you met in the Proving, the one who died. He asks you to help out his mum, so you can continue with the original quest for Meridian, but it's easier to go and deal with the war chief quest first. You're clearly expected to do that because the recommended requirement is much lower, plus it's actually on the way there. You the Proving, so you survived your wounds. High Matriarch Tirsa said you might know the way to Meridian. So we head to Sona's last lone location and follow her trail using the Detective Vision. I mean the Witcher Senses, or Survival Instinct, or whatever the hell it's called. Focus Vision, I suppose. You'll never forget how to use Focus Vision to track someone's trail because the tutorial comes up on the screen every damn time you find a trail. There doesn't appear to be a way to turn it off. You eventually catch up with Sona and talk to her about taking down the people who attacked Lenora. She's found them and their corrupted machines. You can either take them out with stealth or go in all arrows blazing. If you're like me, you'll try the stealth option, fuck it up, and then have to shoot your way out. Even after you've taken care of this lot, there are still some attackers left to kill. They've taken refuge at a place called Devil's Thirst, which is outside the Embrace and therefore taboo to the Nora. Sona tells Aloy that the next thing to do is to clear out three bandit camps on the way to Devil's Thirst. I cannot believe for a second there's not another way around these bandit camps to get to Devil's Thirst, but you know, let's go with it. I guess we need practice at taking on these sorts of places. Dealing with these bandit camps is when I gave up any hope of the non-machine combat being interesting. We're out of the tutorial now, so there's no excuse. It's just dull. The stealth combat is basic enough that it can be easily abused. So long as none of the bandits spot you for any length of time, you can just keep picking them off without the alarm being raised, even if the ground is littered with dead bodies. You can also abuse your ability to whistle. By using the whistle, you bring over one enemy at a time for a silent strike in the grass. Now I know the obvious answer is to just ignore these techniques, but the game practically encourages you to do it. You get the whistle ability fairly early on, assuming you spend the skill point on it and it only costs one. And the critical strikes from the grass are really easy to do. In fact, you often leap out of the grass, make a really noisy kill, and no one notices. It's really weird. Anyway, I found my ability to take a stealthy approach in these camps depended heavily on choosing the right path in in the first place. Sometimes I seemed to just sort of luck out and do it properly, and other times I didn't. Some of the approaches make it pretty easy. You just move from patch of grass to patch of grass, doing silent kills all over the place, maybe picking off a few people with a bow and arrow, other approaches, you're effectively going in through the front door, but it's hard to actually know which one is which until you do it. You don't tend to know that until it's too late. I've said a few times now that Horizon borrows heavily from other games, especially open world games. The bandit camps feel a lot like the ones in Shadow of Mordor. While Horizon usually improves on the games that inspire it, in this way it actually falls a bit short. The bandit camps here are lackluster, and the poor enemy AI does the game a discredit, falling well short of the high standards set elsewhere. 
Fighting humans ends up being a huge part of the game, but fortunately it's only these bandit camp infiltrations that feel actively boring. The rest is still pretty meh, I suppose, but it's a little bit more exciting than these bandit camps. Just a little. After taking out these smaller camps you face a bigger battle against the attackers and finally get your revenge. These attackers are conveniently standing near a huge, huge stockpile of blaze which can go up with just one fire arrow. You can either stealth your way over to the blaze or just kind of make a run for it and shoot it. I tried to stealth my way over and ended up having to make a run for it to shoot it. Of course the mystery man in charge of the attack isn't there but that doesn't seem to bother anyone. Despite not enjoying the combat there was a lot to like about this mission because of the relationship between Sona, Val and the connection to Vala who we met only very briefly in The Proving. I kind of understand the role of the war chief and the Nora war tribe and all that kind of stuff a bit better. The weird thing is it doesn't advance the main plot at all even though it is actually considered a main quest. I'll discuss that a bit more later because it kind of pops up again. We still need to head to Meridian. Picking back up on that previous quest, we head to Mother's Crown and talk to a woman named Maria. She points you towards Meridian but tells you that the Karja, the people for whom Meridian is a capital city, won't open the gates to their land until you clear the corrupted machines that are covering the territory just outside it. This is what I meant when I said the middle part of the game lets the story drift while you focus on playing and enjoying the combat. Does Aloy really need to beat all the corrupted machines? I mean couldn't she just climb the walls to get in or sneak through the gate when no machines are nearby? It's silly and I had to admit I had my doubts about the game at this point and its ability to keep me engaged. It was starting to feel like an open world game and not in the ways I appreciate. So once you've cleared the corrupted zone you can finally make your way to Meridian. I was a little under leveled at this stage which I thought was a bit odd but Meridian is so far away that by the time I arrived I was actually over leveled. You have to venture deep into a clouded area of the map so it's worth climbing another tall neck to make the journey a little more interesting. I imagine most people experiment with at least a few of the side objectives on the way there even without putting in a conscious effort to do so. Meridian is an incredible looking city and reminded me of how I felt the first time I made it to Novigrad in Witcher 3. If anything it's actually even more impressive. It's smaller but the city feels just as bustling and there's actually a multi-layered system with an elevator to get you from top to bottom. You don't get much time to explore Meridian at first because the second you arrive you're greeted by a drunk errand who is mourning his sister's death. Aloy, hey, you're alive. I thought you were dead. Make way, make way. All the way to Meridian just to see me. Have you been drinking? Ah, not really. A little. So you're alive. This uh, We should celebrate. The drink's on me. The last time you saw him in Mother's Heart, he mentioned that she'd been captured, but he was confident she would make it out alive. It sounds like she didn't. The captors killed her and he's not taking it well. You tell Erend that you suspect Olin is involved in the attacks on the Nora, so despite his grief he agrees to take you to Olin's house to look for clues to his whereabouts. Okay, how are we gonna get in? <coughs> oh, that was subtle. Here we are. Try not to break anything. Except other than the door. You push a huge crate of ingots onto a trapdoor and discover Olin's secret underground lair. In there they find evidence that he only helped out the attackers because they had his wife and child as hostages. This kind of explains why Olin didn't want to talk to Aloy any more than he had to back in Mother's Heart. He obviously knew the whole conversation was being recorded and didn't actually want her to get in trouble. Olin conveniently left behind a confession in his journal and a large map on the wall with a big marker giving away his location. I suppose you could say he did this on purpose out of a desire to be found but then that wouldn't really explain the locked door to get in this place. I guess Occam's razor probably applies here. The real reason is it's a video game, we need somewhere to go next. Anyway it doesn't matter, I can live with plot conveniences if they keep things moving along. Olin confesses that he's working with the bad guys, a splinter group from the Shadow Carja called the Eclipse. Furthermore, he says that the ultimate boss, the big bad for the game, is basically going to be an entity that refers to itself as Hades. Olin points us on our way to a place called Maker's End. 
As an aside, we can actually later rescue Odin's wife and child, although it's not a mandatory quest. We've been moving from place to place now for quite a while with not much in the way of story development. There's been no real urgency to move the main quest forward. If I'm feeling a bit generous, I might accept this as deliberate. Maybe. When the story is urgent, as a player you either feel the need to push the story forward, or you break the narrative by messing around with side quests that don't feel important compared to the main story. See any side quest in Dragon Age Inquisition, for example. Or for a similar issue, the main quest in Fallout 4 where the man and all woman is supposed to be rescuing their son, yet despite this urgency you can still do random pointless crap. At this point in Horizon, the side quests are actually as interesting as the main story, and feel kind of just as important in a way, so you're perfectly entitled to do these quests instead. Like I said, this is probably a generous interpretation, but Horizon has done enough at this point just to earn a touch of leeway from me here. Speaking of interesting side quests, when Erend realises how powerful Aloy's focus is, he asks her to help find the people who killed his sister. Up until this point, Erend has hit on Aloy and generally acted like a bit of a dick, however I still found myself wanting to help him. Besides, his sister is important to the Kaja as a whole. Walking around the city you hear people mourning her death and there's anger at she's been murdered. Blood for blood. Vengeance for Ursa. You meet up with Erend at the battle site where it looks like Ursa took down a few Shadow Kaja soldiers before she was killed with some of her best troops. When Aloy asks Erend why he wasn't with her, he admits he has a bit of a drinking problem and she probably didn't trust him to join her. Aloy investigates the scene and finds cart tracks and clues to suggest that the bodies were dropped there but not killed there. We whip out focus vision again and follow the tracks until we fall into an ambush from Eren's own tribe, the Osirum. Or at least a splinter group of the Osirum, like the Shadow Osirum or something. After killing all the Osirum, Aloy investigates the scene again and concludes that Ursa wasn't actually the one killed. The evidence for this is a bloody rock and some armour straps. It's not a lot to go on, but again, video games. Erend admits that the body's face was so battered that he couldn't be 100% sure it was Ursa. Erend goes back to Meridian to look again. Sure enough, Erend confirms that the dead body doesn't belong to Ursa because it's lacking a distinctive scar that he gave her when they were fought as kids. Might have been worth checking that out before, but whatever. One of the Sun King's aides thinks that the likely murderer is a man named Duval. He's an Osram and therefore a member of the same tribe as Erend and Ursa. Despite the Osram working with the Sun King for the most part, the Val's been desperate to get revenge on those who helped the Kaja defeat the Mad King. In other words, he took the other side in the Kaja civil war. The Sun King would quite like to send an army after Deval, but he can't risk a war with the Osram. Instead, Aloy and Erend head out to Deval's suspected location and end up with another bandit camp to eliminate. Deval has some machines chained up, so if you're careful and if you have a few override functions, you can actually make this battle a bit easier for yourself. Deval makes you fight one of his champions, but he's not there himself. You defeat the champion and get to Ursa just as she's dying. This is one of the many deathbed speeches in the game. It's a trope I'm not a particular fan of, but it is still a touching moment. Ursa tells Erend that she has faith in him, and that the only reason she didn't call on him for support was because she suspected she was walking into a trap. No, idiot. I got a message from Durval saying he wanted to parlay. I didn't come for you because I knew it was a trap. I couldn't let you get hurt. The Val is still out there. Aloy finds a note about a large shipment of blades headed to Meridian and suspects that Deval may be there. Aloy and Erend find a house that Deval has acquired under a fake name and head there to find a bomb and enough blaze to destroy a part of Meridian. They push the blaze out of the window which triggers the bomb, but without the blaze it's only enough to blow up that one building. Now push. <sighs> While this is all going on, Duval is making his move on the Sun King. Aloy and Erend arrive just in time to stop him. Duval uses a lure to bring in loads of glint hawks, which Aloy has to defeat. Erend resists the urge to kill Duval, but it sounds like he's going to suffer anyway when he's handed back to the Osirum. When broken down to its elements, there wasn't a lot about this quest that was particularly exciting or new. There was a lot of travelling, using focus vision in incredibly unimaginative ways, and then fighting human opponents. It also relied a lot on convenient clues to move things forward. Despite that, I really enjoyed it. Eren's character gets fleshed out in a way that has you feeling guilty for judging him so quickly at the beginning of the game. We also find out more about the Kaja Civil War without the need for a load of exposition dumps. It's actually a topic within the story that I became quite interested in the more the game went on. 
By the time I'd finished this quest, I felt a connection with Erend, the Sun King, and the Kaja people. As a side quest, this would be a story on par with most of the side quests in Witcher 3. However, even though it doesn't appear to progress the main narrative, it's actually labelled as a main quest and not a side quest. It's an essential mission. My suspicion is that Gorilla wanted to make sure players experience this story after all the effort they clearly put into it. I can't begrudge them that, but it does add to the feeling that the middle act of the story consists mainly of padding. At this point I'm ready to go back to the hunt for the Eclipse and to try to uncover the mystery of the machines. Aloy starts the long journey to Maker's End. On the way there, a voice starts talking to her through her focus. Not just any voice, it's the fairly distinctive voice of actor Lance Reddick lending another big name talent to the voice cast. Why are you doing this? Because I want you to succeed. Good hunting. We'll talk later. Wait! Anyway, the mysterious caller talks for long enough to tell Aloy about a hidden weapon stash that will help her in the battle to come. That battle initially seems a bit uninteresting, consisting of more bandit camps, but then you start hearing explosions. Aloy heads to the noise and finds the Eclipse testing a machine that she's not seen before, and neither have we. The Deathbringer is the first machine we see that looks like it's built for killing and only for killing. It doesn't particularly resemble any animal and it looks old and rusty instead of new and shiny. This is something different. The battle has the potential to be tough as hell, but using the whistle or the lure skill, you can trim the numbers down fairly easily. Once you're against the Deathbringer, you need to be more careful. It can bring you down quickly, but it also has plenty of weak spots to aim for. Once the way is clear, Aloy examines a focus on a dead Eclipse soldier. A metallic voice belonging to Hades refers to Aloy as the Entity and makes it clear he's not happy she's still alive. Aloy heads into the mountain and comes across a door like the one in All Mother Mountain that would not open for her. Like that door, this door again scans Aloy, except it confirms that she's a match for a woman named Dr. Sobek. The door opens up. Aloy wanders into an underground base much like the one she fell into as a kid. I'm not sure if I should have already known this at this stage of the story, but right here is the point where I found out when the game is set. Dr. Sobek is very late for a meeting, nearly a thousand years late to be precise. I think at this point it's safe to say the game takes place early in the 31st century. There are loads of data points to collect and automated voices play as you move throughout the facility. You soon find out you're in a building belonging to Faro Automated Solutions, a huge company that made its founder, Ted Faro, the first ever trillionaire. There's a few cool comments from Aloy as she gets to grips with exactly what a corporation is, with the help of the mysterious caller who pops up on her focus again. So they made the focus. 25,000 people? That's big. What was this place? What were they doing here? It was a corporation. A group of people not unlike a tribe. And they made machines. In fact, if you pay attention to the data and audio logs, you get a lot of information early. I'll gloss over how incredibly convenient all these recorded snippets of information are. When the information is this interesting, I don't have a huge problem with audio logs. Farrow, with the help of the aforementioned superstar employee Elizabeth Sobek, built a series of green robots to help solve a climate crisis in the 2040s. Ted Farrow then wanted to start building military machines, which caused Elizabeth Sobek to resign in protest. By the time Aloy has left the compound and climbed the outside of the building, I had a fair idea what happened and it fit with the most likely theory people would have had before playing the game. Humans built machines, machines went rogue, humans died. This felt a touch anticlimactic and predictable, but fortunately there's actually much more to it than that. When Aloy reaches a conference room at the top of the building, she watches a couple of hologrammatic recordings of conversations between Pharaoh and Sobek. Farrow tells Sobek that there has been a glitch with what he refers to as his peacekeepers, which I'm already imagining are anything but peacekeepers. Sobek looks into it and finds out that it is much more than a glitch. Limited self-manufacture controlled. Not anymore. The glitch severed chain of command. The only nation this swarm answers to now is itself. <laughs> you, you think I don't... Everything else is just food. And at the rate it's replicating Ted, it will strip the Earth bare in 15 months. We're not talking fall of civilization, we're talking extinction. Sobek comes up with a solution, of sorts. Project Zero Dawn. 
Project Zero Dawn. Jesus, listen. There has to be another way. I love this scene. When you think back on it, there's not much information here that you didn't already know or strongly suspect, but the tension and anger in the air feels as real as any hologrammatic video message can. You probably hate Pharaoh at this point for being the cause of all this, but to be honest, Dr. Sobek doesn't exactly elicit a lot of sympathy either from the way she acts. I suspect most people already knew that machines went rogue, but it's interesting to note that they consume biomass and can self-replicate. Their rampage against humans is based on a desire to do what humans do, survive and reproduce. Aloy is understandably confused, especially as to the bit about Sobek apparently being her mother despite living a thousand years ago. The mystery caller pops up again and finally gives us his name, Silence. Silence doesn't know how Sobek can be Aloy's mother, but he does mention that cryogenics might have been at play. He encourages Aloy to keep looking for answers by going to US Robotic Command, which was where Sobek was heading next, just after the video recording we watched. By chance, US Robotic Command still exists. The Osseram refer to it as the Grave Horde and it's buried under a metal devil. I suppose nothing good comes easy. Aloy doesn't particularly trust this random stranger, but he's not telling her to do anything she wouldn't do anyway. Aloy heads to the Grave Horde and fights her way to another complex that looks a lot like the last one. There are more data files, but these all have a distinctive military theme, talking about missions and assaults on the deadly machines. A couple of interesting stories are hinted at here. I heard a panicked wife wondering why she hadn't been receiving messages from her husband. When she did get them, they sounded fake, as if they'd been artificially put together. When she inquired about his status, he was always described as operational. I initially thought this was hinting at a story of humans becoming machines, but that doesn't actually appear to be the case. I haven't found every data file, so I might be missing something. I'm sure fans will piece everything together once the game has had time to settle and there's a wiki for it and all that stuff. There are a few basic puzzles to open doors and some power cells to find, but nothing remotely taxing. We have more Eclipse soldiers to take on, although the underground setting does lend itself to stealth more than the open camps on the surface. I still wouldn't say any of these sections are fun, but I can get through them now. That's something at least. There's also another Deathbringer to fight, except this one can actually move. The more impressive looking Metal Devil appears to be non-functional. When Aloy reaches the US Robotic Command Center, she finds yet another hologrammatic recording, and we get a little bit more information about Project Zero Dawn. It's really two things. First, every man and woman who is capable of shooting a gun gets one, and is basically told to go and kill machines. This will be called Operation Enduring Freedom. The purpose of this mission is to buy time for Sobek to develop the real solution to the problem, i.e. Project Zero Dawn. The reactions of the military commanders make it clear that the entire prospect is horrifying, but General Herez insists they have no choice. Sobek goes to an orbital launch base to begin preparations, so that's where Aloy is off to next. The good news is that Silence knows exactly where the base is, because of course he does. The bad news is that it's under the Citadel, which is the palace at Sunfall, the capital of the Shadow Karja. Before Aloy can approach, she'll need to disable the Eclipse's focus devices, otherwise she'll be spotted immediately. Silence helps Aloy find a back way into the Eclipse base so that she can take down the focus network. This involves taking on loads more human opponents and then scaling a modified tool neck to destroy the module that's sending out the signal. When Aloy attempts to destroy the module, Hades makes another appearance and taunts Aloy until she destroys the module. This is not the time. It's a metal devil. Open the module's casing now. Aloy, do as I say or all is lost. Entity has come here. Entity miscalculated. Entity cannot destroy me. I am beyond its reach. Maybe you are, but this isn't! Destroy the Entity! This wasn't a particularly interesting mission. If you question Silence a bit more, he reveals that he used to work for the Eclipse and did terrible things that he's now trying to make up for. That's about all we learn here of note. We're at the end of the second act now, and from this point on, every main quest significantly advances the main story. 
I think this is a good point to start delving into some of the other parts of the game, like graphics and sound and how you move around the map. After the next mission, it's going to be much harder to tear ourselves away from the critical path. I'm not going to spend as long talking about graphics and sound as those sections probably deserve. That's not because I don't appreciate the look of the game, I'm just far from an expert on game engines and all that lovely stuff. Also, this is a video so you can see how good the game looks and in the rare moments I shut up you can hear how good the game sounds. It's bloody impressive. Since I love comparing Horizon to other games, I will say that it doesn't quite look as good as Uncharted 4 at the high points, however this is an open world game so I wouldn't expect it to. I'm playing on a regular PS4 mind you, so perhaps one of those fancy PS Pro things looks better. One of the elements it borrows from the Uncharted series is the diverse locations. There's a fine line between nitpicking and genuine concerns about a setting or story. This is an example of how I'm not looking to pick flaws in every aspect of the game. The World of Horizon takes place over a few square miles, but it has every different climate and environment you could imagine. Now I've lived in the Bay Area so I'm familiar with microclimates, but this is on another level. I don't care. It's a video game and space and distance are one of those things we just have to accept will not be realistically portrayed in the near future. Besides, it's hard to be angry when it looks this good. Each area has the potential for different weather effects, which are some of the best I've ever seen. The dry desert region has sandstorms, the mountains have snow, and the tropical jungles get torrential downpours of rain that will make you stop and stare at the screen in disbelief at times. This video almost certainly won't do it justice. Mind you, the weather and day-night cycles do change far too quickly and it can be a touch distracting at times. The cities also look glorious. Meridian and Sunfall in particular are incredible, especially when viewed from a distance like at the top of a nearby mountain. There's also some cool other little effects like when the game wants to show off you'll get a slow motion thing as you jump between handholds that are far apart. It's pretty cheesy but it is still effective. I'm not going to dwell on the good stuff. You can see how good the game looks and it performs fine with a constant 30 FPS throughout. Obviously it would be nice if it was at 60 but 30 is okay. I did notice a couple of dropped frames when the game was still loading up after fast travel or saving but that's about it. There are a couple of issues that might not be obvious from the video and from other gameplay footage I've seen. I'd say the major weak point is character models. I don't mean things like clothing. Aloy moves realistically and her hair and clothing move in a believable way as she runs and walks. It's actually pretty mesmerising at times. However, the skin on most of the characters looks kind of plastic and I'd say that Aloy suffers from this more than most. A lot of other characters have, say, facial hair or visibly ageing skin, but because Aloy's quite pale, you get this unnatural shine that is almost so bad you'd expect characters to be shielding their eyes from the reflection. Her arms also look weirdly doll-like. Again, this is probably just me being spoiled by the insane work Naughty Dog did with Uncharted and their facial recognition technology, but it is something I noticed. I found transitions between gameplay and cutscene to be distracting at times, especially in the first act. It seemed to improve as the game wore on, or perhaps I just got used to it. It's not a huge issue, but it did feel odd, and because it's a cutscene, it's kind of distracting from what's supposed to be a cinematic moment. The lighting glitches out occasionally with lens flare staying on the screen in weird places and shadows disappearing in and out of view as you move. There's also this weird line across the middle of the screen sometimes and you can actually see the point at which additional textures start popping in if you look closely. It's the sort of thing that you could probably play the entire game without noticing. The second you do notice it, it's really hard to then not see it all the time. I'm not sure if it will actually show up on a YouTube video, but it is there. I'd also have to say that water looks notably worse than the rest of the environment. It's like a texture pack hasn't loaded in yet, it's kind of odd. There are also a few minor issues with like floating shrubbery occasionally, but you could easily go the entire game without seeing something like that. Gorilla has created a beautiful open world with a level of polish that is increasingly rare these days. I never buy games for graphics alone and Horizon would be just as good if it looked a little ropey around the edges. That doesn't mean I don't appreciate beauty when I see it though and that's definitely what we have here. 
There's even these cool little touches like rusty old machines lying around in the environment. That didn't mean much to me at first, but then near the end of the story you kind of get what that means, and it's a pretty cool effect for world building. Sound is something I'm even more reluctant to talk about than graphics. I'm really completely clueless and tone deaf. Parts of Horizon are worthy of note though, even for someone like me. First I have to say that the score is really subtle and actually quite rarely used. I remember roaming from place to place in Witcher, like riding Roach around the mountains and stuff like that, and the score would come in just every now and again and you would stop and listen to it. It was just incredible. It was actually some of the most memorable parts of that game. Most of the time in Horizon you're running around and you're listening to the sounds of like wildlife, be it natural or unnatural, or things like you know the rain gushing down or the wind or whatever. It's still really good, but I can't help but think that a dominant score could have dragged a few extra emotions out of players. It's a bit artificial, but then they say you shouldn't notice good scores, so perhaps it was there and I just didn't notice it and that's a good thing. Other cool stuff in the sound department I noticed was the noise that tear arrows make as they rip armour from machines. You'll hear a lot of that I expect if you use that weapon and it never gets old, it's brilliant. The big machines also make a lot of loud noise when you're near them, but nothing more so than the tall necks. The thud they make when you're near them is incredible. They sound as good as they look. All right. Now I just have to reach its head. The voice acting in Horizon is consistently brilliant. Most of the credit will go to Ashley Burke and Lance Reddick, and unfortunately those are the only names I know off the top of my head that were in there. But actually it's really good all round. I didn't notice any voice acting that sounded sort of cheesy or out of place. Try me. I had a lover. Worked on monuments to their bastard king. Then he gave them a show in their sun ring for good measure. However, the stilted facial animations mean that even after spending 40 hours with the game, I still don't associate Burke's voice with Aloy in the way I do with, say, Doug Cockle as Geralt, or Nolan North as Nathan Drake. There are also a few lip syncing issues, especially in the side missions and smaller quests. Redica's silence is much easier because his character closely resembles him personally, and you're often looking at him as a hologram, so the lack of facial animations isn't so much of a problem. With Aloy, it's something that constantly bugs me. Burke's performance is phenomenal, so that's one thing to make clear, but the CGI animation just isn't up to par and there's this weird kind of disconnect. It reminds me of when Keith Sutherland took over as Snake. If you were used to hearing David Hayter, something just sounded off with Keith Sutherland, even though his performance was probably perfectly fine. I'm hoping this feeling will pass and that I won't notice it in a sequel. Like I say, there's nothing actually wrong with the voice acting, I just don't think the CGI is quite up to standard. Sounded us all. To kill the Sun King. What shadow, what twilight time he brought upon us. And how many more would the Mad Sun King have killed if Avad hadn't stopped him? Hopefully this video gives you some idea of the sound. I don't want to diminish the work that the sound engineers have put in, I'm just not qualified to talk about it in a way that adds to what you can hear yourself from a basic gameplay video. If you've been watching the video you've probably seen a fair bit of Aloy climbing. I'm sure at first glance it looks similar to the climbing in Tomb Raider and Uncharted. I'm kind of surprised I'm saying this, but actually the climbing in Horizon is even better. You don't need to constantly press X to have Aloy move from ledge to ledge to handhold to handhold. You just hold the direction you want her to go in and she moves. There's an occasional big jump requiring a button press, but that's it. That might sound boring and less interactive, but I actually much prefer this system. Hammering X to move in Uncharted doesn't require any skill, it's just something mind-numbing that you do. I can tell you it gets pretty tedious after four games. In Horizon, Gorilla is kind of admitting that the act of climbing from ledge to ledge in this way isn't actually difficult, and it just makes it as smooth as possible. Like a minor quality of life improvement that come the end of the game you'll be really thankful for. I do have one issue with the climbing, and that's the randomness of when you can and cannot do it. Climbable ledges are marked with white, which by the way can be quite difficult to view in heavy rain, but there are plenty of ledges that Aloy really should be able to grab hold of, but for no discernible reason can't. On the plus side, Horizon is generous with its Skyrim jumping, and nearly all of the mountains can be scaled by hammering X and being persistent. You can actually get to some places you really think you shouldn't be able to by doing this, and I remember one mission just kind of constantly jumping up a mountain until I had a really good high point, and then shooting down at some bandits below when they couldn't get me. 
I'm not entirely sure if I broke the game or did something that they kind of anticipated. Well, either way, it was cool. The animations when you do this kind of Skyrim jumping thing make it clear it's not really part of the game. But I think the developers have had issues with unclimbable mountains in other games and thought, no, you know what, this is not fun. Let's just let the player go where they want to go. I remember in particular playing Dragon Age where you know a direction you need to go in and you kind of look at the map and you can't tell what's an unclimbable mountain and what's not. So you're just trying to head in the direction and then you get really near the top and there's one bit you just can't get over. That kind of thing is just not fun in my book and I think Gorilla kind of knew that. Speaking of navigation, the game has a crap ton of information on the screen to guide you where you should be going. I strongly recommend you set the UI to dynamic to ensure that not everything is showing on the screen at once. When you set a destination, you are shown the path to take to get there. So not only do you know it's, I don't know, say north of you, you might also know that you have to go west first to get on a path and then, you know, follow it around or whatever. This extra information might annoy a lot of people because it's extra clutter on the screen, but I actually really liked it. Again, going back to other huge open world games like Skyrim, Dragon Age, Fallout, etc. Sometimes just knowing the direction you need to go in is not enough. It can be especially useful when you're trying to get from one part of a town to another. Like if there's buildings blocking the way, you can't just head in the direction you need to go. And these waypoints will sort of navigate you around the crowds. It's actually pretty cool. The map itself could use some work though. There's a lot of markers on that map and there's no way to filter out or cut down on the visual noise. I can't help but think this will be patched in later and it's really strange that it's not included in the game from the get-go. There's not even a legend so that you know which each symbol means, you just kind of have to guess. Most of it's intuitive, but some of it isn't. Okay, let's get back to the story. With the focus network down, Aloy can wander into Sunfall without being recognised. Let's pretend for a second that actually makes sense. I guess it's better than having to endure a tedious stealth section to get in there. Aloy makes it deep into the capital by posing as a bounty hunter before she sneaks off to take a route underground that Silence has already prepared for her. This came from how the old ones achieved such marvels only to fall into silence and death. A lifetime of failure as year by year. We're in another underground facility that looks a lot like all the others. There are plenty more audio logs to pick up again, but this time I ignored them and pushed forward. I was desperate to get more answers and suspected that an info dump might be coming up. I was not disappointed. Via an yet another hologrammatic message, General Harris tells an audience that the rumour about a super weapons program being developed is just that, a rumour. There's no super weapons program. There's nothing that can save humanity. That I'm the one who spread them. And they are all lies. Zero Dawn is not a super weapons program. And it will not save us. Nothing will save us. So what's the point of Operation Enduring Freedom? Why are millions of people throwing their lives away for it? One reason. To buy time for you and the work you will do here. Zero Day. The day that life on Earth ceases to exist is coming fast. It cannot be stopped. The hope of Zero Dawn is that something new might come after. Pretty powerful stuff. I've read and watched plenty of sci-fi work that includes the prospect of human extinction, but I've never read or seen anything where it actually happens. We're not talking about most people dying, we're talking about the entire species. Of course, this raises a few questions in the context of the game we're playing, but we don't have to wait long for answers. Sobek finally tells us what Project Zero Dawn truly is. It's… well, it's complicated. I'll try and sum it up. With humanity extinct and the planet a barren wasteland, there's no way to simply wait it out in shelters and come back to the surface in a few decades. In other words, you can't use a fallout shelter, basically. Life needs to start anew. Sobek plans to build an AI named Gaia to initially rebuild the environment and then eventually reintroduce humanity. Gaia is the core, but she'll be assisted by what Sobek refers to as subordinate functions. Sobek and her team have 15 months to build this system, that's Gaia and all the subordinate functions, and then lock it down before humanity ceases to exist. Just to be clear, humanity is going to cease to exist either way, the question is just whether Sobek and her team can get this system done in time. This is part of the story that really shows the effort and attention to detail that Gorilla put into building a believable world. The machines have a deactivation code, but it will take over 50 years to crack. That's going to be Gaia's first job. When Gaia has that code, she will distribute it via a network of spires to shut down the Pharaoh robots. Then the real work begins, and you're going to have to forgive my god-awful pronunciation here. 
The subordinate functions are all named after Greek gods, and my Greek is pretty bad. Of the subordinate functions, Ether will create the technology to detoxify the atmosphere, Demeter will regreen the Earth, and Poseidon will detoxify the seas. To accomplish all this, Hephaestus will build machines in underground cauldrons to assist with the terraforming project. Machines like the Grazers and the Striders were built for this purpose. That's what we've seen being built in the cauldrons. In fact, except the Deathbringer, none of the machines Aloy has fought were created by Pharaoh Automated Solutions. They were created as part of Project Zero Dawn to help get Earth ready for humans and animals again. The machines look like animals because humanity didn't teach Hephaestus how to build particular machines. It taught the program how to develop its own machines using information given to it about animals and plant life. It's the teach a man to fish and etc etc. Artemis is responsible for reintroducing animals when the time is right, and Eleuthia clones and raises humans from genetic stock. That's going to be pretty important. Apollo is dedicated to archiving human history to ensure that the next batch of humans know where they came from and hopefully avoid making the same mistakes. The new humans will learn about their past through a hologrammatic interface and a gamified curricula. Knowing humanity, I can completely imagine a gamified curricula working. Finally, there's Hades. Hades is an extinction failsafe. Basically, if Gaia makes a hash of the project, then Hades can bring the Pharaoh robots back online and have them destroy the planet again so that Gaia can start from scratch. I have a few issues with this, which we can discuss later. It's a bit of a weird concept, and I don't really think it works. But anyway. There's a lot to unpack here, but without a doubt, the most interesting point is that all of humanity did go extinct. Everyone alive today is descended from people born from genetic stock and grown in a machine, as opposed to being born of a natural mother. The main question raised by these revelations is, what the hell went wrong? More answers are on the way. Aloy has to take on a few more Eclipse soldiers, which is a great time to listen to the audio logs. You can hear the doubts and confusions of those chosen to be part of the project. I'll say again, I'm still sceptical of audio logs in games, but if you're going to do them, this is how. These audio logs had me gripped for the most part. Aloy learns a bit more about each subordinate function as she moves through the facility until she gets to Sobek's office. Here we see that Sobek deliberately taught Gaia to care. She gave it feelings. Sobek wanted Gaia to feel as well as to think so that it had skin in the game, so to speak. At this point, Helis, the leader of the Eclipse and the man who killed Rost back at the Proving, swings down and captures Aloy, but like any good bad guy, he elects to talk her ear off instead of killing her immediately. Helis tells Aloy that he sent an army to destroy the Nora, and then he crushes Aloy's focus and throws her into a gladiator ring to face off against the machine without her gear. Aloy quickly reclaims her gear anyway, and escapes with the help of Silence who gives her a new focus. You'd think Aloy would now head immediately to the Sacred Lands to help defend the Nora, but you're actually given the choice to what you want to do next. This is probably the first time I felt disconnected from the story. Helis just made it clear that an army is marching on the Nora. Aloy should head straight there with no delay. It's what I did, but I don't really like that the game gave you a choice. I know that's part of open worlds and they have to stop occasionally to let you go and do other things, but I don't think it would do any harm to just send Aloy straight on the next part of the mission. It wasn't that long ago that Silence gave Aloy a warning that she should be prepared for what was to come. I think that could justify the extended mission length here before getting another breather. So Aloy takes on a few groups of Eclipse soldiers on her way to protect the Nora. She defeats corrupted machines and gets help from Val and Sona as she heads towards Mother's Heart. Val tells Aloy that Tirsa ordered the Nora to take shelter in the mountain despite that usually being forbidden. Now that the corruption has been cleared, Aloy is able to open the door in the mountain and enter the room which she was supposedly born. You come across more hologrammatic messages showing children being taught by robots which they call servitors in cradle facilities. Something goes wrong because one of the servitors announces that there's no food left and that the children will have to go outside and fend for themselves. I think we're looking at the first ever humans allowed back into the outside world here. It's not actually confirmed, but it would make a lot of sense. It also ties into the Karja's sun worship. The children mention their desire to see the real sun instead of looking at pictures. I want to see the real sun, not lights and pictures. You will in time, children. So I imagine when they were freed, they would probably treat the sun with a degree of reverence. As we know, the Karja worship the sun. They have a sun king. Even the shadow Karja who have rebelled still call their city sun full. At this point, I can't help but wonder why Sobek and her crew couldn't have continued to live and procreate in one of these facilities. Clearly, these facilities are capable of producing food, so why couldn't they have done it for a small group of humans? 
There would probably need to be a one-child rule or something like that to control the population, but it has to be better than going extinct. There is a mention of a facility called Elysium planned for the group, but it seems like it fails. Even in Elysium, everyone is sterilized, so there's no real attempt to actually keep humanity going through this group. It's just the people in Elysium were hoping to live out their lives until an old age. A lot of them end up committing suicide. Apparently it's too difficult to sustain a group of 2,000 people for 100 years, but it seems like a minor challenge compared to everything else they're doing here, and you'd think it would be worth taking a stab at it at the very least. After making it to Gaia, we get another info dump that for once answers more questions than it asks. Gaia explains what went wrong before Aloy was born and what caused the derangement that has turned machines against humans. The Prime facility received an unknown transmission from an unknown source which transformed all the subordinate functions into self-aware entities of a highly chaotic nature. As you might have guessed, a highly chaotic Hades is not a good thing. Hades tries to take control of the entire Prime facility, so Gaia essentially commits suicide by overloading the main reactor, destroying Hades and herself along with it. Worst of all, that's only a short-term solution. Gaia states that the terraforming functions will eventually break down and become chaotic. That's what Aloy knows as the derangement. The resulting explosion will destroy Hades. Unfortunately, it will destroy me as well. While this admittedly desperate course of action will avert the immediate crisis, the fate of life on Earth will remain in peril. With no central governing intelligence to regulate the terraforming system, it will continue operations for some time, but in an increasingly chaotic manner, and eventually it will break down. Uh, does she mean the derangement? Gaia's solution to all this is to have the Cradle Facility give birth to a new child based on the genetic material of Sobek. A reinstantiation of Elizabeth Sobek, my creator. Gaia believes Aloy will be nurtured by the community outside the facility. The plan is that once she's an adult, she can come back to this facility and go to all the others thanks to her gene print being a match for Sobex. Then Aloy can rebuild the system and reboot Gaia. Simple. Except it's really not, I'll discuss that more later, I don't want to go off on too many tangents here. Gaia slips in a few convenient lines to explain why Aloy couldn't access this facility immediately, but we don't need to worry about that too much. I think this is something that's just been added in to preempt people like me nitpicking at the story too much. Gaia instructs Aloy to go to Gaia Prime and find the Master Override. This is how Aloy will destroy Hades. I think this part just goes to show how silly it was to build a Hades function in the first place. Clearly Gaia can operate without Hades if she's insisting it be destroyed before the reboot, and it always felt a little contrived in the first place. I mean, let's say Gaia made a mess of things and needed to start again. Why would that require robots to kill all human life? If the conditions are too bad for humans to survive, well then they'll all die. If conditions are too bad for humans to exist at all, well then Gaia just has to keep trying and keep working on it, the robots wouldn't be needed then anyway. I can't really think of a situation where you would want the robots to come back to life and kill the humans that are on the earth, it doesn't really make sense. But the game needs a big bad, and Hades is the big bad. Will find a way. In you, all things are possible. Go to the ruins of Gaia Prime. Find the control room, and within it, the Master Override. This will give you the power to purge Hades so long as you find a way to wield it. Do not attempt repair of the system core until Hades is eradicated. Hades must be destroyed. That is all. I only wish that I could hear your voice again. Aloy heads back to the mountain where she finds Anora worshipping her. All praise Aloy, anointed of the Nora. All praise she doesn't take too kindly to this and has a go at them for being self-righteous hypocrites. She doesn't want to be worshipped as a god. Fortunately, she doesn't dwell too long on the whole being the creation of a machine thing. She has every right to, but as the player, I'm glad she doesn't really bother. It doesn't really make any sense anyway, because everyone alive today is descended from people created by machines. She's not really that different, she's just a few generations away from it. There are a few points worth thinking about here though. Now that we know the circumstances of Aloy's birth, I'm still confused as to why the doors open for her when she's not a 100% match. You'd have to forgive my ignorance of genetics, but why wouldn't the door just only open when there's a 100% match? I mean, surely Sobek would be a 100% match for herself. Any variation on that DNA means that it's not Sobek. 
even if you say that, well, Gaia programmed the doors to open for a close match, why do the doors then talk to her as if she is Sobek? I don't think this bit really makes any sense. I also have a few issues with Gaia generally. For an incredibly capable AI, she does have her dense moments. She didn't realise that Aloy would be shunned by the Nora as an outcast, which is excused because she isn't allowed to communicate with humans above ground. I guess that's fine. A bigger concern is her belief that by Aloy being a genetic copy of Sobek, she will grow up to be clever enough to reboot Gaia and solve this mystery. This is a bit of a leap. Nurture plays a huge role in a human's development. While Sobek was clever, she didn't work in a vacuum. Sobek was able to develop Gaia thanks to a career built learning from others and benefiting from shared experiences. Aloy would have been brought up in a simple civilization, and finding a focus device doesn't impart a wealth of knowledge on the wearer, otherwise you could just give it to anyone. Plus, how did Gaia know she would find that focus device in the first place? Sobek is a genius by the sounds of it, but so are other people like, I don't know, Sir Isaac Newton for example. Newton couldn't do what Sobek did because he grew up in a different time. Similarly, if you sent Sobek back, I don't know, 400 years, 500 years, she couldn't accomplish what she did now, and she couldn't build Gaia 500 years ago. She has to build on technological developments by other people, you know, the creation of electricity being one obvious thing. Aloy isn't going to be anywhere near as advanced as Sobek just because she's got the same gene pool. And anyway, why would you create only one version of Aloy? You could create a few and then scatter them around to give one of them a better chance of surviving. This is my major gripe with the story. I'm not a huge fan of Chosen One narratives at all, and this verge is far too close to that for my liking. I like to think that Aloy is the person she is today because of her upbringing with Rost and her determination and character and all that sort of stuff. I don't want to think that she was just destined to do all this because she happens to have the same genes as someone else who was really clever and lived a thousand years ago. Anyway, I said something about not going off on tangents, so let's move on. Aloy makes it to Gaia Prime following the familiar pattern of taking on Eclipse soldiers on the way. Once inside, Aloy finds Sobek's journals, but the Focus needs time to decrypt them. Best not to think about that too much. Apparently the Focus is actually quite limited on what it can do, but I think this is just to make sure you can't read the journals until a bit later. We now find out what happened to Sobek. Gaia went operational as planned, but there was a gap in one of the outer doors that was big enough to let out an energy signature for the machines to find them. Obviously if the machines find them before they complete their work, then the whole project is screwed. Sobek is the one to go outside and close the door, but it's a one-way trip. There's no way to close it from the inside, so she gets stuck outdoors. This also seems a bit silly, and you can't help but think of like, well, couldn't she have shut it from the inside some way, or some sort of alternative, but it doesn't affect the main story. This is just a way to give an important character a powerful and emotional send-off. The alternative is just to have her be one of the people who chooses to commit suicide or dies of old age. That's not really that much fun, so I'm fine with this. Okay, everyone. I've repaired the seal. Gaia? Seal closure at 1.4 millimeters. Confirmed. Elizabeth, no. We'll find a way to bring you back in. It's not gonna happen. The swarm's too cold. Really? It's all right. Gaia's complete. She'll take care of things from here on out. That's what she does. Not like this. There's so much we- Guys, you know me. I'm... I'm no good endings at letting things end, so, um... Let's not. Aloy climbs to the top of the building and makes it to what looks like a conference room with a load of dead bodies. She plays another hologrammatic message and Ted Farrow pops up to talk to the group. This is probably my favourite scene in the entire game, and you'll have to forgive me, but I just I want to let this play out in full. I think it's brilliant. I'm locked out of core control. Alpha clearance overridden. What the hell is Omega clearance? Oh no. Alpha personnel. Sorry to alarm you, but I need you to listen, okay? To what I'm about to say. This isn't easy. See, uh... <clears throat> I've, um, please, stop trying to access the system, okay? See, see, what this is about is, um, I said stop trying to access the goddamn system. And what, what I'm trying to say is I can't stop thinking about the ones who come after us. Those innocents, those blameless men and, 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 and women. We're going to give them knowledge? Like it's a gift? Ted, Ted, we've talked about this before. 
Apollo has 3,000 plus fail-safe conditions. It's not a gift, it's a disease. They're the cure, and we're gonna give them the disease. Our disease? No. We can't. And it's not too late. If we're willing to sacrifice. Ted, it doesn't need to be like this. It already is, Samina. I did it three minutes ago. I've purged Apollo. It's gone. All of it. Every copy. A sacrifice? It's not a sacrifice. It's cultural obliteration, you crazy bastard. Millennia of culture. I'm sorry. Really, I am. But sometimes, to protect innocence, innocents have to die. Emergency alert. Brutal stuff. Pharaoh has destroyed the Apollo subordinate function to prevent the next generation from learning what came before them. He talks about it as if it's a good thing, not wanting to burden them with their disease and all that sort of stuff. It's not a strong argument. He's selfish and motivated by a desire not to be remembered as the man responsible for the extinction of the human race. Horizon relies heavily on these hologrammatic recordings. I know they're a convenient plot device, but damn, they can be really powerful at times. I, I actually really like them. This one's a great example. When you walk in, you see the skeletons in the room and you pretty much know exactly what's going to happen. Then the hologrammatic recording starts and you watch those holograms move slowly towards their final resting positions. It's pretty intense. I think it's worth discussing the second version of Apollo here. The audio logs contain brief mentions of an outer space mission by a group called Far Zenith using a spaceship called Odyssey. I think Far Zenith is a, another corporation like Pharaoh Automated Solutions, but I didn't really find a lot of information about them. Anyway, it does appear that Far Zenith developed cryogenic freezing. They may have frozen humans on board or just embryos, I'm not too sure, but either way the idea was to take these frozen embryos into a distant star system. They're actually going outside of the solar system. Sobek had some concerns with this because the Apollo information on board Odyssey did not have the failsafes that the main Apollo system did. We don't really know much specifically about what those failsafes were. I think it was probably things like drip feeding information to humanity so they didn't sort of, you know, find out the end of the book before they read the beginning kind of a thing. There was mention of this gamified curricula earlier, so I assume that humanity was going to get taught its history in stages. Another data log from Sobek states that the mission failed when Odyssey tried to leave the solar system. I'm going to come back to this at the end because I think we may be looking at a clue to the sequel and a really big mystery here. Silence cares more about knowledge than most people, and he's furious at the loss of Apollo. He shows up to make his confession to Aloy. Silence helped Hades form Eclipse in the first place. Silence was desperate for information about the old ones, and Hades was the only thing that could give him the information he craved. His confession comes with a lead. Hades is not interested in Meridian, he's interested in the Spire, which was built by Minerva, one of Gaia's other subordinate functions. The spies were what sent out the kill signals to the Pharaoh robots once the code had been cracked. Many years ago, Hades betrayed Silence, so he went into hiding. Silence gives Aloy a new lance to which she attaches the Master Override. Not entirely sure why she needs his lance and why she can't just use hers, but whatever. Now she's ready to take on Hades, but she could use some help. This is where I'm going to talk about the game's side quests. As I've mentioned, the side quests are much more than just your basic fetch quest. In fact, they actually play into the ending more than I expected. The game never bothers to tell you this, but if you complete side quests for people, you'll be able to call on them for the final battle. The Witcher 3 did something similar and was also similarly vague about how it played into the game. I'm actually surprised more wasn't made of this feature. Quests like Eren's hunt for his sister and helping Sona get revenge for the Nora don't directly impact the main story and yet for some reason they were elevated to main quest status. Other huge quests don't get the same treatment and I'm at a loss to explain why. My best guess is that without these additional quests being made mandatory the overall completion time for the game would have been I don't know, about 5 hours shorter and as much as I hate to admit it, there are people out there who won't buy a game at full price if it can be completed in a time frame that they deem to be too short. Perhaps a better approach would have been some sort of influence meter with each of the tribes, so the more you help the tribes out, except the Shadow Kaja of course, the more they will support you at the end of the game. Instead you can easily complete the story without actually noticing that you have fewer friends there at the end of the game. 
Conversely, if you complete all of the side quests, then plenty of familiar faces will be by your side to fight the final onslaught of machines. Let's go through a couple of these side quests, because I think when a developer goes to the effort of making side quests worth my time to play, then it's only fair I take the time to talk about them. The side quests generally fall into one of two categories. They tend to revolve around you either needing to go and fetch a thing, or to go and find a person who has run off or disappeared. Now the difference between these being side quests as opposed to errands is the amount of story that we get to go alongside it. Take A Daughter's Vengeance for example. Yan tells you that his sister Nakoa has left the Sacred Lands to find their father's killer. You end up at Day Tower and are surprised to find the killer, Zaid, is out in the open and not hostile, he's just hanging around basically. Zaid explains there's been a case of mistaken identity and the commander of the area backs him up. Aloy is suspicious but she takes Zaid's recommendation and travels to a place called Lonesome Rock where she is eventually ambushed. It turns out it actually was Zaid all along and he has Nakoa captive. Even a fetch quest can prove illuminating under the circumstances. Fia needs Dream Willow to ease the pain of a wounded brave. You go looking for the Dream Willow in the stashes, but there's actually none there. You go back to Fia, and then she sends you off to talk to the supplier. At this point, I really do feel like I'm running around doing nothing, and it's quite annoying. But when you go to speak to the supplier, you actually find him trapped in his house after outcasts stole his supplies of Dream Willow. So of course you go after the outcasts, and they are being chased by machines. You help them defeat the machines and then talk to the outcasts. The outcasts confess that yes, they did take the Dream Willow, but only because he refused to sell it to them just because they're outcasts. They even left behind money to pay for it. Aloy takes pity on fellow outcasts and lets them keep some of the Dream Willow. At this point in the story, Aloy is free to go anywhere and people are talking to her again now, so it's good that this quest reminds you that the Nora treat outcasts like shit, and they're actually quite aggressive in following their belief system regardless of the harm it might cause others. You don't see much of the Banuk tribe during the story. They're much like the Nora in that they keep to themselves and spend more time worrying about gods than technology. Despite this lack of technological prowess, a Banuk camp has a group of docile machines hanging around and minding their own business, like pets or something. Aloy investigates and finds that there is an artifact keeping the machines friendly. Unfortunately, a group of Osirum are hanging around and tampering with the artifact. Sure enough, the Osirum break it and the machines turn hostile. There are even side quests to complete for the Shadow Kaja. Two of these have you uncovering a conspiracy involving the High Priest, which ends with you helping the young Child King escape Sunfall from Meridian. I'm still amazed at how much I enjoyed the story about the Kaja Civil War and the unrest that followed. There's quite a lot in the game about the Kaja Civil War and more specifically the aftermath of that, but it never is directly involved in the story, it's always kind of on the fringes, but you still get involved through these additional side quests. There's other stuff as well, like you'll rescue a young girl who is suicidal after the disappearance of her boyfriend. Unfortunately, he ends up dying before you can save him, but she's still there for you at the end of the game. There's also a brother who is so keen on inheriting his father's wealth that he lures those really annoying glint hawk machines to the area just to kill his father and sister. I completed most of these side quests without even realising that it was helping me with the main quest. They were just cool stories that I wanted to complete. Of course, there are a couple of duds in there as well. Uh, chasing down escaped convicts was pretty boring, and one of those bits actually glitched out on me. And helping to defend an Osirum camp from machines and bandits was pretty boring. In addition to these side stories, you can also join the Hunter's Lodge by killing progressively challenging machines until you're ready to take on Redmore, a Thunderjaw who's been causing some problems in the area. This plays out a lot like a guild storyline in Skyrim, except it moves a bit quicker. It does feel a little disjointed from the main story. With the other side quests, Aloy is just helping people in need. With this Hunter's Lodge quest, she's doing it because she figures it would be cool to join, even though there's presumably more important things to do. Of course, by the end of this quest line, it becomes clear that taking down Redmore is definitely a job worth doing, but that's an afterthought, and it's not really the sole reason Aloy joins. This quest is yet another one of those that teaches you about the Karja and their civil war without you even realising it. The new king has made it mandatory that the Hunter's Lodge accept all applicants regardless of gender and race and what tribe they come from. This causes some tension as you might expect. There's one more odd mission worth discussing. It's not really a side quest, but it makes as much sense to talk about it here as anywhere else because I did it right before progressing with the next part of the story. There's an underground lair with an impressive set of armour on display, but you can't get to it until you've solved a couple of basic puzzles. The puzzles aren't the problem, in fact the solution is pretty obvious, but you need power cells to activate the switches. There are five of these power cells in total, and you won't be able to get the fifth one until this part of the game. Once you have all the power cells, you can pop back down here and claim your gear. 
This isn't just any old piece of armour, this stuff basically makes you invincible. You can take a hell of a lot of damage before the shield on it comes down, and that shield recharges pretty quickly as long as you can find a few seconds where you don't get hit. Now the game is tough, so yeah, I mean I equipped this armour, I'm all for using the tools made available to me. That said, the armour does slightly break the game. You're only going to struggle against large machines with this armour set on, and you can actually survive huge falls as well. The armour feels like it should be end game content. This feels like something you'd get as a reward for completing the game and that you can then wear when you're going around getting collectibles and all that sort of stuff. And in that context I think it could have worked really well, I'm just surprised they gave it to you right before the end of the game. Ok so we've got all our crew together now assuming we've done the side quests, so let's get back to the story. The final couple of missions don't require a lot of discussion. We know all about Project Zero Dawn, so we just need to defeat Helis of the Eclipse and then Hades. Helis is up first. He's just a normal human opponent except with a bigger HP bar. I am chosen. This was not meant to be. Then you have to defend Meridian from a huge machine onslaught, which you will do alongside your allies if you completed their side quests. After that you head to the Spire. Hades has beaten you to it. The signal starts getting pumped out and we see images from around the world of deadly machines coming back to life. You make it to Hades, but you have to take on a final Deathbringer before you can reach him to use the Master Override. Now I'm not a huge fan of boss battles because they usually feel overly artificial and interrupt the story flow of the game. This one definitely doesn't do that, but it does feel a bit of an anticlimax anyway. I'd have expected to have fought a new machine here instead of one we've already seen a couple of times before. After taking down the Deathbringer, Aloy shoves her lance inside a spherical object that represents Hades and uses the Master Override to end the Extinction Protocol. The Deathbringers around the world are deactivated, although it's not clear what happens to the machines created by Hephaestus. I don't think the Override would turn back the derangement, so the Cauldrons are likely still pumping out deadly machines, and other machines will continue to attack on sight. Anyway, let's not spoil Aloy's moment, I'll give her the benefit of the doubt and assume that she goes back to reboot Gaia right after having a few celebratory drinks. As an aside, I guess this is why we had to do Val and Eren stories as main quests, it's to make sure they're here on the mountain for this cutscene I expect. This is a decent ending to a really good story. I know I've picked a few holes in it, but telling a story in an open world video game is incredibly difficult. I'd go as far as to say this is one of the best there is. It's a believable post-apocalyptic world, which coming so soon after I played Fallout 4 really is a breath of fresh air for me. Of course, we're not done yet. Aloy's focus finally decoded those journals belonging to Dr. Sobek, so she heads to Sobek's childhood home. We learn that Sobek always wanted a daughter, which is presumably what inspired Gaia to create Aloy. Aloy finds Sobek's body, which is still lying there undisturbed after a thousand years. Yeah, one thousand years. I guess it's not important, but I'll add this to the list of fortunate plot conveniences. We don't technically know where this is, but when Sobek shut the door that kept Gaia safe, she mentioned that the machines were close, so I feel like she shouldn't have been able to get far, which means that wherever this is, it's not that far away, and I don't understand how this body has been left untouched all this time. She appears to have died peacefully anyway. I did wonder at one point whether there was an outside possibility that the suit has cryogenically frozen her, but I think we see a decomposed arm to disprove that theory. I still think this cryogenic freezing has a role to play. There was a data entry about Sobek where she says that she was really impressed by the Far Zenith cryogenic freezing technology. There's been a couple of mentions of this now, so in some way or another it's going to come into play, but I'll discuss that a bit more later in the video. We're still not done. Horizon is set in the 31st century, but it's remembered one thing from the 21st century, the post credit sequence. Hades is still alive. He floats around and ends up in some magical lantern carried by Silence. I really hate this. The story of Horizon might be far-fetched, but it's built on concepts of science and specifically computer programming. This is more akin to magic. 
I know it's only a teaser for a sequel, but there were so many other ways they could have illustrated the same point. Why didn't Hades just transmit himself into Silence Focus device or something like that, or just use the power grid? I mean, there must have been another way to illustrate this. I don't think it's a good note to go out on, however, there's lots of unanswered questions for a sequel, and like I say, I think this is just designed to be a teaser. Has its rewards, don't you think? Well, let's begin. Before I start getting into wild theories about where the story is going in a sequel, I just want to sum up how I feel about the story as a whole. I mean, generally I think it's brilliant. These days every new game has to have franchise potential. That means we often get games like I know, Deus Ex Mankind Divided where the story in the game is clearly not complete. It's supposed to be part of something bigger, like usually a trilogy. Horizon Zero Dawn is a complete story, despite the few unanswered questions. It reminds me a bit of the first Matrix movie. When you watch that movie there was clearly a lot going on, lots of things to wonder about and the world and the sequels dived into that, albeit not very successfully. But the first Matrix movie is still a really solid story. I think that's what we've got here in Horizon and hopefully the sequels will fare better than the Matrix one. I've probably appeared a bit inconsistent with my approach to plot holes and you know plot conveniences and things like that. I think when things are convenient I do try to just look past them because basically every story relies on these kind of conveniences to push it along. I mean every TV show, movie, book, if you don't have these sort of coincidences then the story just doesn't happen. So you need that to a certain extent and I try to let it go as much as possible. I'm less flexible with potholes especially if they bug me on first viewing. The more I have to think about them the less I'm usually bothered by them unless they absolutely destroy the story. A couple of the plot holes here did actually bother me on my first viewing. I certainly had really two issues and that's this whole chosen one narrative around Aloy which I don't think makes much sense. Why would Gaia pin all our hopes on one person who could die at any time? Second I think is just the existence of Hades and I'm sure I'm not the only one to point this out. I think the writers knew it was an issue and they did their best to justify it in some stages by describing the potential for like a harmful atmosphere for example. However, I really can't think of anything that would justify another extinction of the human race and the use of those pharaoh robots. As I've said before, I think if Gaia has made a mess of things then, well then humanity is not there anyway. Like I say, the game obviously needs a big bad and okay, I can kind of accept Hades in that role. A more minor issue is that I don't think the derangement is well explained in the story. I like the eventual explanation we get for why the machines look like familiar animals and dinosaurs and that kind of stuff, but at the beginning when Aloy is a baby we see a Thunderjaw with weapons on its back. It was right back in the credits scene, the bit that sort of looked a bit like Jurassic Park. This doesn't seem to quite fit with the story for me. You see, when Aloy was a young baby in this scene, it must have been what less than a year after the issue with Hades and the other subordinate functions becoming self-aware. Guy mentioned that at some point Hephaestus might lose control, but it seems a bit weird that within a year she would create these massive dinosaur-like creatures. I've seen it suggested that these dinosaurs and um, even other things like the Watchers are there to keep the beast safe from humanity. I can believe that to a certain extent, I don't know, I think the Thunderjaw and the Rockbreakers for example are pretty extreme examples. I don't really believe Hephaestus should have been creating them until the derangement really set in. I got a feeling that that would have taken a little bit more than a year, but it's never really made clear. The overall storytelling here though is very strong throughout. I'll remember the Sun King and the Kaja as much as I remember Project Zero Dawn. The Osram and the Banuk tribes don't get much attention, but I'd actually prefer just have a couple of tribes that get fleshed out rather than have them all spread thin. You know, perhaps that's what the sequel is for. For those of you who like collectibles there are plenty on offer here and most of them are not too difficult to find, at least not once you've bought the maps that tell you where to go. Some of the collectibles are actually quite interesting, others not so much. Let's start with the positives. There are six Banuk figures dotted around that require you to do some of the more athletic climbing and jumping and walking on ropes to get to. If you're anything like me you'll try Skyrim jumping your way to each figure before realising that the correct route is actually marked with really bright obvious Banuk paintings on the mountains, and then you'll feel rather stupid. There's nothing challenging here of course, but the climbing does make you feel like you've accomplished something and then you get a nice view at the top. Talking of views, the 12 vantage points give you brief glimpses into the past and a sort of an audio log to go along with it. 
It reminds me a bit of when you look at an old black and white photo next to a present day photo of the exact same place. It's kind of like the opposite of that because of course in these ones the older images look modern and new whereas present day is all sort of old and rusty and collapsed buildings and stuff. I'm actually a sucker for these kind of images and so the vantages were quite cool for me. My favourite was probably the vantage over Sunfall's Gladiatorial Arena which actually used to be a sports stadium. There's also a story to go along with the vantages where a man's sort of writing messages to his mother reminiscing about times they spent together and what he's doing now. It's surprisingly touching and another example of the attention to detail in the world. Unfortunately, the ancient vessels and metal flowers are much less interesting. They're just lying around openly in the environment, so you just sort of walk up, get them, travel away to the next one. It's not very exciting. There's a merchant who will buy the ancient vessels from you because he's convinced they were part of a fascinating shaving ritual that the old ones used to do. As A. Louis points out to him, they're just mugs for drinking out of. I do like that there's a pretty cool kill zone easter egg on these though. Your rewards for collecting all these items are incredibly disappointing. You get trophies if you care about that, but in the game you only get these sort of low level weapon modifications and some random junk. That's it. Some of these items are hidden deep in dangerous parts of the map, so I don't understand why the rewards couldn't have been a little bit more generous. For true 100% completion, you're going to need to collect over 100 data points, probably nearer 200 actually in total. You'll stumble across most of these during the story missions where you enter underground facilities. They tend to be grouped together in like three or four at a time, and yeah, most of them are fairly hard to miss as long as you've got your focus vision on occasionally. If you can, I recommend you listen to them as you pick them up because then you tend to get more context for what's going on around you and they even give clues to cutscenes coming up and stuff like that. There's also data points littered around the world and it will take you much longer to find these. I expect someone to put a map of them all up online but there's quite a few and they are just sort of randomly dotted around this huge world so good luck. They also don't seem to be as interesting or at least I didn't think they were, not the ones I found anyway. Speaking of sequels, Horizon is clearly going to have one. There are still unanswered questions and these are not minor issues to be relegated to the fringes. The most obvious question I have is who sent the message that sent the subordinate functions rogue in the first place? There's not really an obvious candidate. I suppose most people will look at Silence because he was kind of a bad guy during this, or a bit mixed at least, but his story about stumbling on Hades seemed really convincing. Silence values knowledge more than chaos, so I don't think he'd risk taking down the whole system, and I'm not really sure he was capable of doing that anyway. My theory is this Far Zenith project around the Odyssey spaceship. I don't know if there were humans on board the Odyssey spaceship when it attempted to leave the solar system or whether it was just frozen embryos, but clearly there was some sort of cryogenic freezing on board, and that ship had all the Apollo information without the failsafe backups. Sobek mentions her concern about the Apollo backups on Odyssey not having the safeguards that the one on Earth did. There's a concern I guess that any humans born in space won't handle the information well. We're never really told what these safeguards are, but I think the idea of it is to kind of drip feed information to human beings. There's this gamified curricula get, that gets mentioned. And I guess the main issue is that they don't want the new humans to sort of come into all this knowledge immediately and not know what to do with it and maybe make the same mistakes. So whatever these safeguards are, they are not on the Odyssey spaceship. Now, Sobek mentions in a journal that the Odyssey mission failed when they tried to leave the solar system. I don't think it did. From a storytelling perspective, it does seem odd to introduce the concept if you're just going to kill it off as quickly. The Odyssey crew is essentially a backup of Apollo, which is the one group that Pharaoh decided to kill off. Perhaps Sobek lied, maybe because she knew Pharaoh might go after them, and in that case perhaps the crew survived and flourished somewhere in space. Now they're probably in another solar system, or at least they were a thousand years ago. Why would they risk coming back and destroying the Earth? Well, yeah, who the hell knows. I guess they could want to reclaim Earth for themselves, like maybe their project in the next solar system is struggling and you know they need a planet like Earth. Or maybe they're looking at the Gaia project and a bit like Hades, they think it's failed and they're trying to sort of reset it. I think those are possibilities, but my most likely theory is that they're actually trying to help. My theory is that they discovered the Apollo function had been destroyed and wanted to give it back to Gaia. So maybe they were trying to sort of send the signal, the Apollo information to Gaia so that that Gaia could help, you know, the Nora and, you know, humanity existing at the time. Something obviously went wrong and, well, we know the rest. Another obvious suspect would be Ted Farrow. Silence specifically mentioned cryogenic freezing technology to Aloy and yet it never really formed part of a story. It also pops up in Sobek's journals, like I said. 
My thinking is that this is actually a deliberate red herring. The Odyssey mission was only contained in these audio logs and data logs, but the mention of cryogenic freezing was part of the main dialogue. I think if there's a clue to the sequel, and I reckon it's more likely to be hidden away than it is to be in broad daylight. That said... They're going to see me. You underestimate the ease of hiding in plain sight. Anyway, let's imagine that humanity did create cryogenic freezing in time. Pharaoh is definitely selfish enough to use it himself, and who knows what he'd be capable of when he wakes up in the future. Also, if Gorilla is going for some sort of, say, a trilogy here, it makes sense to include the, the big bad, as it were, in the first game, as opposed to just introducing them in the second game or the third. I'm sure there are theories out there about Sobek being alive somehow, but I do hope she's dead. It would take some really good writing to convincingly bring her back into the fold at this point. As much as I've had my complaints, I think Horizon is actually one of the best games on the PlayStation 4. It's a rare gem of a complete story that also plants the seeds for a sequel. I've probably come across as overly critical during this analysis, but it came from a good place. Guerrilla has produced a polished product which only had a couple of minor bugs and glitches on launch. I hate that this is the case, but that's actually pretty rare these days. There were a couple of pre-order bonuses, I think, like armor sets and stuff, but at least there were no microtransactions, so all in all, pretty good on the business side of things. I completed the campaign after 35 hours, but by that point I'd already done a decent chunk of the side content. I'm sure you can complete the game in, say, 15 to 20 hours if you skip all the cutscenes that you can actually skip, but that's not going to be much fun. I got the Platinum after a total of 40 hours. In all that time, I only had two quests glitch out, and they were quite easy to sort of reboot by reloading a recent quick save, and I got stuck in the environment once. It's not ideal, but like I say, it's a pretty big game. I played on launch. It could be a lot worse, because the quick saves were really good, actually. I think on balance, I'd prefer The Witcher 3 to Horizon, but it's definitely a close run thing. After playing The Witcher, I did not expect to play another game that good for a very long time, so Guerrilla Games deserves all the plaudits it's getting for this. People often talk about world building in games like this, but I think they're often referring to quantity over quality. I haven't shit on Dragon Age for a while, so let's do that now. You could spend days reading all the material on Dragon Age. It's like mini books and novels in there and all sorts of stuff. Some of it adds to the world, or most of it adds to the world in some respect, I suppose, but it's clearly filler content and a lot of it is really low quality. That's not the case in Horizon. Most of the audio logs are genuinely fascinating. My favourite ones are whether people selected for Project Zero Dawn try to get to grips with their assignments. There's even angry letters from reception desks desperately asking for support to help sedate those who don't handle the information well. It's interesting to see that even at the end of the human race there's still this kind of office politics going on. Aloy is an incredible character and is up there with Nathan Drake for believability. Video game characters who talk and act like real people are few and far between, but Aloy is definitely one of them. My only thing is, I think she could use another main character to bounce off, so be it a close friend, mentor, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. I think Nathan Drake's best moments are when he's talking to like Sully, Elena, Chloe, or Sam in the most recent game. Aloy's best moments also pop up in conversations, but she's never travelling with anyone for any period of time. She doesn't have that one person who's around to sort of bounce off and that kind of thing. Rost and Silence are definitely memorable, but most of the other characters are forgettable and we're not going to miss them if they're not in the sequel. If there's one thing I'd like Gorilla to focus on for the sequel, it's the combat against human opponents. First of all, I think it should be scaled back. I don't want to be fighting humans. I think most people are playing the game to fight machines, not human arrow fodder. Second, the combat system needs to be expanded so that Aloy can quickly take on multiple enemies and handle herself in melee combat. In an ideal world, there would also be a believable stealth system, but I can live without the stealth system if we don't need to use stealth in the first place. Even if you've watched this entire video, and if you have, Wow, congratulations, because it looks like it's going to be about two and a half hours long. Even if you've watched this entire video and had the game spoiled for you, I still recommend you go out and buy it if you can. I had my doubts about starting another open world game with all these obvious tropes, especially after coming on to the back of like Fallout 4, Skyrim, and all that kind of stuff. But the tropes in, in Horizon are either implemented in a compelling manner or just really easily ignored. I still wish they weren't there for the most part, but you know, if you're going to have them, let's at least have them in the way that Gorilla have done them. That said, I would love it if Gorilla just abandoned the skill and leveling system, got rid of all inventory management, and cut down drastically on the crafting. That would really help me enjoy a sequel. But, you know, even if all that stuff is there, let's be honest, I'm probably still going to buy it. I can be overly critical when going through games, and you're probably not getting that impression because I've been fairly positive generally towards Horizon. 
I'm actually quite a skeptical bastard, but Horizon is a really, really good game. Anyway, so thank you for listening. I'm pretty new at this, but my aim is to get another one out in about a month. My next one is probably going to be Mass Effect Andromeda. I'll have to see if I get on with it and have anything even vaguely interesting to say about it. I haven't played it yet. This isn't a full-time job or anything for me, so, you know, I mean, I have no idea realistically when I can get another project up. We'll have to see. Of course, if you can do that whole like, share, subscribe nonsense, then that would help me out a lot. And if there's any other sort of current games that you'd like to see an in-depth breakdown of, then, you know, let me know because maybe I can do it. Not Persona 5, though. That game is just too huge. It'd take me three months to go through that thing. Anyway, thanks a lot for listening to the end. Drop in a comment if you've got anything to say, and I'll probably reply because I can't imagine many people going to do it. All right, thanks.